here's our outline. Um, so, so we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to sort of assume that we have a data set, and I'm just going to walk through the process that I would do with a data set if I was consulting for a client or um, doing a project. Uh, I'll just sort of go through, th through it and uh, talk about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and give some best practices along the way. And so that's, that's kind of the goal here. Along the way, we'll just stick in some uh, time for you to try things out and make sure you're kind of understanding things or, and, and practice it. I, I found that, you know, we learn from listening, but we also learn from doing as well, and we often learn more from doing. So talk about um, ingesting your data, checking on the types, this thing called chaining, um, uh, whatever mutation means in pandas, uh, application, and uh, aggregation here. Okay, so here, here's our imports. Let's just, actually, I'm going to restart my kernel here at the, the top here, um, just so we saw, see that I'm not cheating. And I'll come up here, and I'm going to say all output clear. Okay, so, so, so hopefully you have this notebook and you're following along on your own. Um, we do have a helper if people need help to get uh, things installed on their machine. Okay, so I'm going to run this first cell here. Um, it looked like it worked. Uh, this should be pretty standard for most of you. Uh, this percent map plotlib inline you probably don't need, but I put it in there just for legacy purposes because some of my clients need that. Um, so we are importing pandas here. Uh, I'm also importing this pi arrow library. So uh, part of Pandas 2 is that it has a better integration with PyArrow, so we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, the other imports, well, we're importing NumPy uh, display uh, to show, show import to show data frames, and then I, I've got some imports here just for loading data. Um, so, so let's look at the Pandas version I'm using. It is 2.02. .02. So again, if you run this on your machine, it says Pandas like 152 or Pandas uh, 0 0.24. Um, probably a lot of this code won't work on your machine because again, this is catered towards Pandas too. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about a lot of the, the features of Pandas 2 that uh, might make you interested in trying it out. So uh, another thing that's important here another thing that's important here is, is this um, import right here, Pi arrow. Uh, if you are using Pandas 2 um, and you haven't installed Pi arrow, you're going to want to install Pi arrow and then restart your kernel. If you load pandas, if you load pandas and you don't have Pi arrow installed, um, then you can't really get the benefits of pandas two. So make make sure that you have pandas two and Pi, or pandas and Pi arrow installed. So I'm using Pi arrow twelve. Um, if this doesn't run, this cell doesn't run. Do like a pip install Pi arrow and restart your kernel. Okay. Uh, the, the data I'm going to be looking at is uh, the GSS data that's like the general uh, social survey, I think, is, is what that is. Anyone familiar with that? Okay. Um, so, so basically, uh, I, I believe there's, I'm not, I'm not even sure who, who's doing it, but um, it's like a 40-year-old or maybe 60-year-old uh, survey basically that they, they take some people every year and they ask them questions and then they tr and then they sample different people over time and ask them the same questions and see if uh, opinions change on that so uh, this next uh, these next few cells you actually don't need to run um, so you can if you want to recreate this you can you can go to like this web page and you can get the data here and then you can run this which takes a few minutes to open up um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to just skip over this, but this, uh, this uh, data here has like 6,000 columns of information in it, and I've, I've whittled it down to like 
uh, 12 columns or something like that. Um, and I've, I've done some further processing on it as well. So um, these are the columns that I've pulled out of this. There, there's like a cookbook and it has um, like 5,000 pages in it or something of what everything, like it's the data dictionary for what's in there. So the columns that I'm pulling out of this general social survey are the year columns, uh, the ID of the respondent, their age. Um, this HRS1 is the number of hours they worked last week. Um, OCC is their occupation. So, so this just gives you an, an idea of like what this looks like. Um, you can go to like page 126 of this PDF that I, I linked to and uh, you can see like there's a bunch of codes that explain what these do and then you can see that there's some notes and then like there's an appendix on page 3286 that like describes what's going on there. Uh, so, so fun data set, uh, what, they, what these people majored in in college, uh, sex, race, uh, were they born in, in the United States? Uh, and then it has these weird columns like income and then income 06. So this is like what their income was in 1970 and then this is like what their income is in 2006. Um, so in, yeah, back in 70 they didn't have this income. So, so there's a lot of like missing data in this as well. Um, like there's a question about how important it is to be honest, so I pulled that out. And then I, I've also pulled out this, this question about have they ever received a traffic ticket. Um, so yeah, uh, some further processing on this. So this, like here's like uh, encoding from like whatever page this is, 3,286 or no, from 186, I just, there's a PDF, I like pulled out this PDF, and this is like the encoding, I, I think of like what they studied in college. Um, and uh, I, I made a dictionary of this to encode that, and then I, I cleaned up this a little bit. So uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of cleanup here that I've kind of done to this to make it a little bit more palatable, just a little bit easier to use. And then I save this as a CSV file. So we can kind of just like ignore this part for, for now. Um, you know, after this, it probably will make more sense about what this is all doing up there. But for, for our purposes, we'll just sort of gloss over that. And instead of having this huge data set with 6,000 columns, we'll start off with a data set that's a little bit clearer here. So we'll, we'll start off in this types here and uh, we'll run this cell. So hopefully you can run this cell right here. Uh, I am using this cell magic here, percent percent time. A cell magic is neither Python code nor Markdown code, but it's code, it's a directive to Jupyter. In this case, it's saying, hey, Jupyter, tell us how long you take to run this cell. A couple things to note about uh, what's going on here, like uh, this probably looks familiar to you if you use pandas. Maybe this right here, like index column is zero. Um, sometimes when you write a CSV file, uh, pandas is going to write the index in there. And so I'm just going to say use the index that was written out rather than creating a new index. These probably, if you haven't used pandas too, are probably completely new to you. So dtype back in and py and engine. So uh, read CSV is one of those fun functions. Uh, according to Kaggle, this is the function that is the most popular function in all of pandas dumb. Um, it's probably due to like Kaggle uh, being a machine learning competition uh, subsidiary of Google, uh, uh, probably because they ship their files as CSVs. So it's kind of like if you're using them, you, you kind of need to read the CSV to start off with. But uh, th this is one of those fun functions that has like 50 different parameters here. Um, and, and so, and not only are there like 50 different parameters, there like a lot of these have like five different things that you can pass into them. Um, so don't fret too much about this. Like, um, I, like I said, I've used pandas for a long time and I, I haven't used all 50 of these different parameters here. Generally, in general, you don't need to use uh, too many of them. Uh, but yeah, two of them that you might want to start worrying about here are these uh, D type back and and the engine one here. And if, if you're reading your data from other sources, um, uh, they 
they probably have one of the one or both of these as well. So, uh, what does D-type backend do? Well, let's let's actually ask pandas what it does. Um, you know, rather than like me giving you the fish, I'll teach you how to fish. Um, so, so here's here's um, D-type, which isn't what we want. Um, it's probably down here a little bit lower. Okay, so it's it's the last one here. D-type backend, and then engine. It's probably in here somewhere as well. Question. Yeah. How are you pulling up the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. How do I pull up the doc stream? Great question. So I am in Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook, but this will work in Jupyter Lab as well. Um, after you've loaded your your um, code, um, Jupyter has pretty good tab completion. And it also has the ability to pull up the documentation. So I put my cursor right here, either after the name of the function or after the uh, parentheses here. Hold down Shift and hit Tab. If I do that once in Jupyter Notebook, which is for a lot of people old school, it uh, pulls up this. Um, however, generally I want to hold down Shift and hit Tab four times in Jupyter Notebook. And then it pulls up this little window down here where I can scroll. Um, Jupyter Labs a little bit different, um, but if you hit Shift Tab, it should pull up the documentation. Alternatively, there's also a command in, in Jupyter. Again, this is a Jupyter command. It's not a Python command. I can put a question mark in a cell, and that will do the same thing as that. Um, so, so there's the documentation. Uh, let me just show you one more thing. If you're not familiar with it, you can put a double question mark there as well. This is also not Python code. If you run that, we'll escape that. If you run this, it looks like it does the same thing. Um, it gives you the documentation, but it also gives you the source code for this as well. So we can scroll down here and we can see that here, here is the implementation of read CSV, which is actually just a short wrapper around, um, whoops, a short wrapper around this underscore read function. Okay, so uh, back to our, our question, like what does PyArrow do and what does, or what does D-type back backend do and what does, does engine do? So, so I'm gonna see if, if we can answer this from looking at the documentation here. Um, so we, we, we did see that uh, the, this one D-type backend was the in there and engine, here's engine. Okay, so we'll, we'll just scroll through here and see if we can find engine in this novel of, of documentation here. Here's engine right here. This is the parser engine to use. <coughs> so um, it, it says you can use, it, it says the C and PyArrow engines are faster while the Python engine is more feature complete. So, so we are reading CSV files. The nice thing about CSV files it, CSV short for comma separated value. Uh, the nice thing about CSV files is that they're human readable and that's about the end of the niceness of CSV files. Uh, um, there is a standard for CSV files but the standard came out like 10 or so years ago and CSV files have been around for a lot longer than that. So the, um, pandas basically took it upon themselves to be able to read like 99.999% of CSV files in existence, hence the explosion of all the parameters here. Um, so um, the Python engine being like uh, feature complete, uh, probably don't need, fe like, like I said, I've used pandas for a long time and I, I haven't used all 50 different parameters of this. Um, but uh, the PyArrow engine is a lot faster. So, um, for example, it says like if you use PyArrow, you get like multi-threading. Whoops, uh, which which is kind of cool. Um, it also says it's experimental here, um, a, as of pandas 1.4. Um, but I, I've seen that it works pretty well. So basically, what this is saying, this engine here is this is saying. Uh, don't use Py Panda's built-in parser to read the CSV file. Use PyArrow's parser, and it should be faster. Okay, so let's see if we can divine what this D-type backend means, and apparently that's at the bottom here of this novel. Uh, here it is. This was added in version 2.0, and 
uh, it says it defaults to be using NumPy back data frames, um, but you can also uh, pass in pi arrow here. Okay, so, so this is probably the key for if you are using Pandas 2, this is probably going to be like the key uh, benefit of using Pandas 2, is that you're using the pi arrow backend. So I talked with a lot of you before we begin this course. It seems like a lot of you do have like some basic understanding of, num of pandas and are actually using it. Um, but for, for in short, like Python is a slow language. And so it's kind of weird that like I would go around and teach like companies like NASA how to use Python uh, uh, when it's a slow language to like crunch numbers. Why would you want to use a slow language to crunch numbers? And, the, and sort of the dirty secret here, and probably the, re the reason this conference exists is, is because of this library called NumPy, right? And basically what NumPy is giving us is it's giving us uh, fast implementation of, of numeric processing uh, using uh, C and Fortran and uh, giving us a Python interface for that. And, and um, so there are some, some issues where like NumPy maybe doesn't support Pandas features as well as it could. And so hence you can think of PyArrow as basic or Arrow, the Arrow library is sort of like a NumPy plus plus that has a few more features or is, is, is better suited for um, Pandas. So, so we'll see that uh, play out here. Yeah, question. <coughs> when to use pandas versus Python or when to use pandas versus NumPy? Okay. Yeah, the question was when should I use pandas versus Python? And um, uh, I mean, my take on that is if I have structured or tabular data, I'm going to use pandas. Okay, what do I mean by structure or tabular data? It means that I have something in rows and columns. Um, I, I just find that, uh, could I use Python, like pure Python, or like the CSV module from Python to slice and dice that? Yeah, I could, but Pandas gives me a lot of functionality. It's faster, it's easier, and I can do a lot more things with it. So, and it also has relatively good integration with plotting and I'm a huge fan of visualization, and so it just makes it a lot easier to do things than doing it in pen, than doing it in pure Python. What do I get from doing it in pure Python? Um, I don't have to install anything, so um, that's nice, um, but that's, that's about it. Otherwise, it's slow. Um, uh, so, so unless you have an environment where like you absolutely cannot install anything, uh, I would be using pandas for tabular, tabular data. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so there should be a link up for, for, for that on there, but uh, for this class, everything we need is, is, at, this, is at this repo. So you, don't, you, you won't need to do that because like this CSV file is in the repo. So either clone the repo. Yeah. So you can skip, you, you, yeah, you can skip everything to, you, you should run the imports and then you can skip everything to this type section. Yeah, sorry I didn't make that clear. So the question I thought she was asking, was hoping she would ask, is it seems to me, and I'm new, entirely new here, it seems to me that if Pandas does everything that num, uh, whatever this num thing, uh, NumPy does, why would I, if I have a small brain, why would I bother with NumPy when Pandas probably does it and I like the columns thing? Yeah. So, so, so this question I think is when should I use pandas versus when should I use NumPy? Um, yeah. So, so here, here's my basic rule of thumb. If I have tabular data that has different types of columns and the columns are important to me, um, like the column names, that sort of thing are important to me, I'll use pandas. If I'm doing like linear algebra and I just have a bunch of data, 
all of the types are homogenous. It's either all floats or all integers. And I don't really, I mean, I have columns, but I more have matrices because I'm doing like linear algebra or something like that, then I would stay in NumPy. NumPy things? Yeah, so the question, why not use pandas for matrices? <coughs> um, basically, speed, NumPy is fast, like, uh, a, a little, maybe sometimes more than a little. Um, pandas is, is an abstraction on top of the underlying storage mechanism, NumPy or PyArrow, and so um, sometimes when you do operations in NumPy, they can be uh, quicker than, than that. Um, yeah. Okay, great questions. Okay, so um, so so I, I have I have timed how long it took to read this. We have this GS, GSS thing. Um, I'm just going to pull this uh, D types attribute here, and this returns me a pandas series. Um, and, and so I, so there are kind of two basic data types in pandas. Uh, one is a data frame, which is a, a table of data, two-dimensional table of data, and the other is a series, which is a one-dimensional. Uh, basically column. So this is a series. And uh, so, so you might think like, how is this a series, Matt? It doesn't look one dimensional, it looks two dimensional. Well, um, what we have on the left here is what's called an index. And pandas sticks in an index here. So we kind of ignore the index and this is the one dimension right here. Um, so pandas will stick in an index into a data frame and a series. Um, so what we're seeing here is when we access this D types attribute, uh, it is saying in the index is all the column names, and then the values for the series, like this thing right here in 64 bracket pi arrow, this is the type for this. Okay, so a couple things uh, for those who are familiar with like pandas one, but not familiar with pandas two. Um, um, there, so. We have pi arrow here, right? This is because we said D type backend is pi arrow. So the underlying store underneath this is using pi arrow rather than numpy. Um, we also see int 64 here. So those who are familiar with Python, but maybe not numpy or, or pandas or pi arrow, might seem like, what is int 64? Int 64 is not a Python type. There, if, if you download Python from python.org or from in thought or from Anaconda, and you make an integer, like you say, like um, my age is equal to 47, and you say, like, what is the type of age? It is not going to be an int 64, it's going to be an int. So there is no int 64 in Python. And again, this goes back to the, these libraries, NumPy and PyArrow, basically. Um, give us access to a list or an array or a matrix of data that is optimized and doesn't have the overhead that Python does. So this is an eight byte integer that, that Pyro is storing. Um, another thing that you might notice if you're a pandas user is that there is a string type here. Uh, pandas one generally, when you have a string column doesn't say string, what does it say? Object, very good. Yeah, so, so one of the, the main things that people didn't like about NumPy was that NumPy didn't really have great support for strings. There is no string data type in NumPy arrays. And so basically what, what uh, you could say sort of the hack was that you would make an array uh, when you had a string column, you would make a NumPy array and it would basically be pointers back to the Python strings. So at that point, you're kind of getting this Python implementation of strings. You'd get like fast operations on numbers, but when you did things on strings, you're going back to like basically slow, pure Python. Um, so one of the nice things about uh, this Pyro backend is that there is a native string, string type here that we get. Okay, let, let's, uh, so, so this, is, this is this GSS thing here. This is actually a data frame here. Yeah. Yeah, D type. Uh huh. Yeah, so, so let's talk about that. So remember, this, this is a series, 
And um, this is the data that's in the series right here. This is the index for it. And this D type here, this says, what is the type of the data in here, basically? So, th so this would be uh, a, a, a buffer here. And inside of this buffer are actually Python objects because these are types. These are Python types describing each type of the column. Um, however, uh, if we pull off the year column, and I'll do that here, you'll see that it will say the D type of that is actually in 64. The D type is describing what is the data type of what is in this series, and this these are all pi these are all Python types or pi arrow types. Okay, so so if we come in here and we say um, GSS dot year, and we look at that, you can see that um, here are the values for that. There's 64,000 of them. Um, here's the index on the left hand side, and here is the type of this. This actually says that the length of this is 64,000. And this one has a name. It's the name of the column. Can you have the hey, go ahead. Yeah. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah, so can you have mixed types here? So, so I'll, 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 let's, let's try it out and see, right? Can I say map 32 and let's put in like PD uh, data frame in here and let's put in like the range built in in here, right? I mean, this is kind of silly, but uh, yeah, we can do that, right? So you can stick in whatever you want into a pandas uh, series. Um, so this is one of those things where it's like just because you can do this doesn't mean that you should do this. Sort of like, can I take my car and park it on the railroad tracks? Yeah, you can. To me, it's kind of an anti-pattern, right? You, you probably wouldn't want, like if, if someone gave me like a spreadsheet and it had like information in a column, right? And it had like 0, 32, mat, the type of data frame and the class range, that would be kind of weird, right? It'd be hard to manipulate that. But yeah, you can. And basically, it's going back to the object implementation there. You can stick in whatever you want. Generally, you'd want the same types in it. That's where you get the speed up. OK, there's a question over here. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question, like, uh, one thing that I'm going to paraphrase here, one thing that keeps me up at night is missing values. What do we do about those? Um, yeah, so I'll talk about those. Yeah. So restart your notebook. You uh, you probably installed Pyro after you started your notebook. Yeah. So so one of the annoying things is like if you install Pandas two but you don't have Pyro and you load Pandas, um, you basically don't get Pyro until you restart it. Yeah. Okay. 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 So so back to our, our data frame here. Um, th this is our data frame, right? And on the left-hand side here, this thing in bold is the index. So this is not a column. This is the index. Panda sticks that in there if you don't specify it. Things in bold look around the top. Those are the column names. And then you have values in here. You can see that, like, uh, this hours one, you can see that there's some NAs in here. Um, so, so that means that there's some missing values in there. You can see that there's some ellipses down here. Pandas is not showing us... Uh, all 64,000 rows, it's showing us the first five and the last five here. Um, this, and there are 13 columns in here. Uh, so, so just a, a thing, uh, oftentimes when I'm teaching pandas and we see this ellipses here, people are like, I don't want the ellipses. I want all the data. <laughs> um, and, and, and my advice to you 
is if you feel that urge, I mean, I get it. Like if I say you can't see all the data, like I want to see all the data. Um, if you feel the urge to see all the data, you can take that as like that's your spidey sense going off. And what that means is that you should use something that's efficient about doing things rather than something that's not efficient. So humans are not optimized as much as we think we are at getting a spreadsheet with 64,000 rows of data and going through that 64,000 rows of data, like scrolling through it as, as much as that might feel fun to like scroll through 64,000 rows of data to find something interesting. That's not a good use of your time. And you're probably going to be error prone and you're probably going to make mistakes. So if you feel that urge to see all the data, you should probably use a computer to find the data that you want to see or you should use visualization to visualize what's going on in there. Okay. Having said that, yeah, we can see all the data if we really want to, but generally, um, I, I say if, if you feel like you want to see more data, that should probably be a hint to like filter out the data that you want to see or use visualization instead. Okay, so uh, other things. We do have column names in here, which is important. One of those main things that, that makes, I think, pandas better than NumPy or more user-friendly and then NumPy, especially when we're doing things like machine learning. Okay, so let's, so, um, you know, I know a lot of you have familiarity with pandas, but just for fun here, I'm going to say, like, let's use DIR, which DIR is a built-in in Python that tells us uh, how many, uh, what are the attributes of something. So I'm going to say, how many attributes are there on this data frame? And there's 443 attributes on a data frame. So I don't know about you, but my brain is pretty small. And uh, there's been studies that most people can only keep like seven plus or minus two things in their brain at a time, let alone 443 different things in their brain at a time. So yeah, there's a lot of things going on in pandas. Um, uh, let's also look at maybe a series. This is a data frame, but let's pull off like the series here. And there's like 400 plus things that you can do with a series as well. So, so that is a lot, and that's overwhelming, and people are like, how am I ever going to learn pandas, or what, what, what part of pandas do I need to know? Well, l let me uh, maybe calm your nerves a little bit. You don't need to know all 400 different things. Um, also, also, like, if you look at these, we can do, like, some set operations here. We can say, like, let's take the set of this, and then let's do uh, the intersection of the set of the data frame here, and then let's look at the length of that. Uh, of those 400 plus things that you can do with a data frame and a series, 360 of those are basically the same. So there's a lot of things that you can do with both a series and a data frame that are the same operations. You just need to re realize that on one, you're working with a one-dimensional structure. Another one, you're working with a two-dimensional structure. So if something does an aggregation on a one-dimensional structure, it's going to give you back a scalar. If something does an aggregation on a two-dimensional structure, it's going to give you back a one-dimensional structure, which in pandas land is a what? A series. Yeah. So, so if you get that, you should be good. Uh, again, you know, if, if you want to know like the core 400 things, I have an opinion that's pretty strong on that. But um, um, th there are other, you know, we'll go through some of those as well. Now. Again, one of the reasons we want to use like pandas versus, um, you know, pure Python is, is that we get uh, optimized memory usage and speed. So we can, one of those 400 different things, we can say, what is the memory usage of our data frame? And this gives us back a series. In the index here is the column names, and, and in this case, the index as well. And then over here is uh, how much memory we're using. And the type of this, this is an N64. And, and so because this is a series, we can say, I want to sum that up. We don't have to loop through it and sum it up. We can just say, well, just tack on a sum onto that. That's one of the 400 things that it can do. And when we do this, we get like uh, pandas uses 8.6 megs for this data set. Um, note that this is pandas 2. If you were using pandas 1 here, you would get 36 megs on this. So just by um, using pandas, too, by using those uh, pi arrow data types, we're getting a, a pretty good memory saving off the bat. But I'll show you how to get even more memory from this. 
Now, if we were using um, uh, uh, Python to represent this, it'd be uh, quite a bit more memory. Okay. Uh, comment is all of the savings is in the strings. A good chunk of it is in the strings, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and in general, um, the strings, because there is a native string type, right, uh, you get optimization there. Okay. Okay, so, so uh, now that we've got our data loaded, um, what I would do is I would want to, even though like I'm using PyArrow, um, I have like optimized string types, I, if, you, if I was doing a consulting job for you, or I was making a predictive model, the first thing I would do is I would go through my columns and I would check the types of my columns. Um, and I would do this manually. Uh, are there tools that let you like go through your columns and automatically do things for you? Yes, there are. Um, I'm of the opinion that, you know, even though we live in a, a world of like large language models and AIs that will do everything for us, um, I don't think that they're gonna replace us quite yet. And I think the better you can understand your data, the more effective you're going to be able to work with it. You're also going to be more effective at explaining to your boss what's going on when your boss comes and asks you a question about what's going on with your data. So um, let, let's, let's understand integer types. Okay, so the columns that have integer types. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this operation right here. I'm gonna say one of the 400 things I can do is I can say select D types. And again, you can put your cursor here, hold down shift and hit tab and you can, you can see what this does. One of the nice things about pandas in general and a lot of the scientific libraries is that pandas has relatively good documentation here. Like the, the developers of pandas, kudos to them. Um, you know, even though like something have like 40 different parameters or 50 different parameters and it's a small novel to read, that has pretty good documentation. You know, what are the parameters, what it returns, what errors it has, see also, that's kind of nice. Some notes in here. And then there are also examples of this. I like to say this enables what I call desert island style of programming. If you're stranded on a desert um, island and you had a computer that somehow had infinite power supply and had Python and pandas installed, but didn't have like the internet or chat GPT, you could probably get a lot of work done if you knew how to pull up the documentation inside of Jupyter and stay in that environment. In fact, I encourage students to use the documentation inside of Jupyter before automatically jumping to searching for something on the internet or asking ChatGPT how to do something. The more you can stay in your environment, uh, the more uh, distract free you will be and the more um, you'll, you'll just be able to work at a, at a more optimized rate. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna say select D types int and then we're gonna do describe on this. So what I'm doing here is actually what we call a chain I'm doing multiple operations here, and if, if you think about this, this is probably going to return some pandas data type, either a data frame or a series, and then because it returns that, I can do something else on that. So I could write this out, something like this, we call this a chain. Um, however, I would not write that out like this. I would write it out as I show in this next cell here. So what I do is I put parentheses around it, and parentheses mean a couple different things in Python. Like if you put parentheses after a name, it means that you're going to call or run or invoke a method or a function. If you put parentheses around something that's comma delimited, it makes, means you're gonna make a tuple. But parentheses are also used for making parentheticals in Python, right? If I wanna add two numbers before I multiply them, I'd put parentheses around them. Um, in, and, and so we're at a Python conference. We know that in Python, white space is important and that indentation thing is important here. Um, if you are inside of a parenthetical with parentheses, uh, you, you kind of don't need to worry about white space here. So what I like to do is I like to put my original data and then each step, each operation that I'm doing with that on its own line. This might seem like a small thing, but if I show you that first line you're like, and I ask you what this line is doing, um, you just read this and there's a lot kind of going on there, there's a lot of periods, it gets a little bit overwhelming. But if you break it apart like this, it makes a little bit more sense and it actually reads like a recipe. 
So let me show you what I can do. I can come in here and I can come in here and comment these out here and I can say, okay, here is our first operation. We're just saying, what is that GSS thing here? The next thing I'm gonna do is say, what are the D types that are integers? And so this is gonna select the columns that are integers. This looks like a data frame. On this, I'm gonna say describe and uh, this is going to give me summary statistics of that data frame right there. So th this is actually the same thing that we get up here. I just prefer to write it this way because I, it makes it easier to read and understand. So code is often written once or twice, but it's read a lot. And so you want to optimize your code so it's easy to read, not necessarily so it's easy to write. Okay, and this writing your pandas code like this makes it a lot easier to read. It makes it read like a recipe. The index? Yeah, index. I'm just curious, why, why am I not getting an index here? The question is, where does the index go? Why isn't there an index? There is an index. This is the index. It's in bold. Okay, so in pandas, the index does not need to be numeric. It can be whatever you want it to be. It can also have repeating values in it. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. So this is the summary statistics. And this, so, so again, the reason why I was doing this was because I want to understand the integer types. Um, one, once I was teaching this to a client and I, I showed them this code and someone in my class went like this and I said, what's wrong? Did I say something bad? And they said, no, it's just that we spent the last three months, the last three weeks implementing Describe for our business intelligence solution. Um, so this is, yeah, this is kind of nice, right? Like summary statistics with one line of code here. Um, so, so you have count here. Um, so count has a specific meaning in pandas. It's probably not what you think. It's not the number of rows. It is the number of rows with non-missing values. That's what count means if you're in pandas. Um, so mean, uh, that means what you think it means, no pun intended, or it means average. If, if, you're, if, if you're a lay person, a statistician would take issue with that. Um, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, uh, the, the median or 50th percentile, and the quartiles there. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to uh, go through this and just sort of do a gut check on my data here. I can look at the minimum value here, like the minimum value for year is 1970, the maximum value is 2018, um, the ID goes up to like 4,000, um, this OCC goes up to like 999. When I see that 999, my spidey sense sort of goes off. That's kind of a weird value, right? Um, it looks kind of artificial. So I might want to just be aware of that. Like ID only goes up to 4,000. So th I might think that there's only 4,000 unique individuals in this, even though there's like 60,000 rows. Another thing to be aware of is we, we saw these types were int 64s, so 64-bit integers. Um, I don't have the number memorized, but the 64-bit integer goes up to a pretty large number that's probably a bit larger than this. <laughs> so it turns out that all of these, we probably, even though we are using these optimized types, we probably don't even need to use a 64-bit integer to store these. In fact, we could get away with using a smaller integer type and save even more memory. Yeah, the question like, this is annoying, can I get rid of these? Um, yeah, you can, like we could say like, round uh, one here and, and get that. Um, al alternatively, there is, so, so this is actually changing the data, right? It's rounding the data. Alternatively, there is a way to say, pandas, when you display this, I want you to only display this much data. I'm not gonna get into that in this course, but there's a style attribute on pandas, and then on that you can say how you want to format each column using uh, uh, formatting operators. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't grok your first part. 
you, oh, so something I, about civil disobedience? <laughs> Uh huh. Uh, okay. Sorry. Did you say civil disobedience? Or am I just hearing something? Okay. Okay. So the question was like, instead of doing describe, I wanted to see median because I thought one of those 400 different things would be median, and indeed there is like a median in here. And and the comment is that this is a different type. That, that's right, this is a different type. What type is this? It's a series, right? So if you think of this, what this is saying is it's saying I've got two dimensions. I'm saying I want a two-dimensional object. I want the median. The median is an aggregation, right? It collapses and removes a dimension. If I, if I have a list of data and I ask for the median of that, it's going to collapse it to a scalar value. In this case, I have two dimensions. So if I ask for the median of that, it's going to give me the median of every column by default, and it's going to collapse that into a series. So it, it sort of collapses it this way and then rotates that. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so, oh, we're asking about the type, not not why this is a series. Okay, so the type of this is a float 64, and you can see that this ID here is uh, uh, 1029.5, right? So median calculation is if there, there are two values that have the same in the middle, right? You take the average of those, so, or, or, and, and so apparently there's like a 1029 ID and there's a 1030, so this is the median of those. So th th this is a float, and so pandas likes everything to be the same type if it can, so it, it coerced the column to a float column. Okay, so uh, back down to our idea there, there of instead of median here, we want, uh, to maybe can we can use different types because uh, it's a little bit wasteful to use these N64 types. So NumPy has this convenient little function here called iInfo pull up the documentation for that. Uh, this gives you the limits for integer types. And in NumPy, if you hit tab here, you can see that there are a bunch of different types in NumPy. So there's like an 8-bit integer, a 16-bit integer, a 32-bit integer. Um, there are also unsigned integers uh, as well. So I'm going to say, uh, you know, what does the limits look for for an unsigned 8-bit integer? and it goes from 0 to 255. So if we tried to convert these to um, unsigned 8-bit integers, probably wouldn't work because they're outside of the range there. Okay. Um, however, let's look at unsigned 16-bit. These go up to 65,000, so we should be good with those. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, with this GSS, I'm going to change the types here. So one of the 400 things I can do is this as type. And I'm going to say, um, let's just pass in a dictionary here where I convert these types, uh, these columns to these types here. Uh, so let's run that here and do a describe on that. And you can see that uh, this indeed does work. And here we can, there are various types that we can pass in. We can pass in like a list of types. Or we can pass in the string integer. Um, so after we do that, if we look at our memory usage now, uh, we're down to like 7.5 megs. I think we're eight something before. So we do save we, we do save a little bit by doing that as well. Okay, so now we are at our first exercise here. So this is the part where you get to work on this here, and I get to wander around and answer questions if you have them. Um, so uh, I want you to try converting year to an 8-bit integer. And uh, look what happens when you, you convert it to 8-bit integer. And then I want you to try and convert it to 8-bit with pi arrow and see what happens when you do that. OK? I'll, I'll just give you a, a couple minutes to try that on your own. If you have questions or need help, raise your hand. Um, if uh, alternatively you can ask your neighbor, they might be uh, friendly enough to help you as well. 
Okay, so the, fir the first one here, try converting year to an int eight. So I'm gonna come up here. I just like to put parentheses around these things. So I'm just gonna put a parenthesis here. Uh, here is the data, and I'm going to use this dot as type. Note that you do have tab completion in most Jupyter environments here. So I just typed period and hit AS, and then uh, I wanna use as type. If I want the documentation for that, I can hold down shift and, and get that. But basically what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to say, um, let's pass in a dictionary, and I want year to be the type int eight. Okay, so that, that looks like it returned uh, me a result. Do we see anything uh, fishy about that? Yeah, year, year netter 76, the comment was a long time ago. Let's do our, our friend describe, get some summary statistics on this, and we can see that the year goes from negative 76 to negative 30. Okay, so what's going on there? Um, th this is, uh, I guess, uh, the reason why like Pac-Man doesn't go above level 255. Um, uh, basically, we're using an 8-bit integer, and and uh, so I'm going to phrase this carefully. Uh, where you, this is this is saying use an 8-bit integer to store this data in a NumPy array, basically. And so NumPy is happy to just say, okay, um, if I were to convert these numbers to 8-bit integers, this is what they would look like. And because 8-bit uh, integers can't hold values that large, we get what's called integer overflow, uh, resulting in those values right there, like that. Okay, and note that the NumPy backend doesn't really care, it just gives you that. Um, so if you weren't careful about that, you might get years that you really didn't want. Um, note that like converting these back to 64-bit uh, integers doesn't fix that. At this point, this is a lossy conversion. If we convert them back to 64-bit integers, 64-bit integers are happy to hold values of negative 76. So, so that doesn't necessarily fix that. Okay, so let's try this again, the next part here with, with bracket pi arrow. So one, one of the nice things about pi arrow is that it gives us uh, these optimized types. One of the uh, maybe less nice things about it is that it requires a little bit more typing. We gotta put those brackets in there um, to, to tell it to use the pi arrow back. And, and when I do that, I actually get an, er an error here. It says that this is an error invalid. So pi arrow backend is actually doing some checking here. And if you go down to the bottom here, it says that 1972 is not in this range here. So I'm not gonna let you do that. So this is kind of a nice feature that we get from using that pi arrow backend rather than numpy. The numpy just sort of says, okay, I'll do it. And it might not be what you want. The pi arrow actually does some checking for us. Yeah, the question is, can pandas do this automatically for me, uh, compress types? Um, no, not out of the box. Um, it, it doesn't do that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm somewhat reticent to just say, like, do magic to my data frame without me knowing what's going on, because sometimes it might not be the case that you want, you might not actually want to do those conversions, even though you could. Um, so I, I, I do think you, you at least want to be a little bit more explicit rather than just saying blindly convert everything if you can. Um, having said that, yeah, it's not too hard to like go through this and basically you could say, I wanna go through this describe and look through all these max values here and the minimum values and look if they're in a range and, and make a mapping of the types that would, would fit in those ranges. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about floats here. Um, 
So, uh, you know, after I've gone through my integer types, I, I would have, you know, this little as type there to convert my integers as needed. And, and then I might want to look at floats. So I'm going to say uh, select D types floats. In this case, I've got like age and hours worked as, as floating point numbers. Okay, a couple things to note here. Like when I look at age, um, uh, age doesn't really look like a floating point number. I mean, uh, to me, it looks like a whole number, at least from, from the first five rows and the last five rows. So that might be something that I want to see. Is age really a floating point number? Um, hours worked here has a bunch of NAs in here. Um, note that this is... Um, the panda, the pi arrow way of saying that this value is missing. So there are a bunch of missing values in there, and then you can see like this person worked 36 hours in the last week. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, this looks integer esque as well. Um, so we might want to come in here and say, like, let's look at hours worked and do a describe on that. Um, and it looks like the minimum value is zero. The maximum value is someone who's working 89 hours a week. Uh, the median value is 40. The mean value is 41. So it looks like most people are working around 40, 41 hours a week per se. Um, okay, so, so, so what's going on there? Um, one thing, you know, if, if you do have integer-like columns, you might want to do something like this. Um, so, so I also use this a lot for, for string or categorical columns. One of those 400 things is, is called value counts. So what value counts is going to do is it's going to give me uh, the summary of the values with their associated counts here. So this, this is the, the uh, summary of the hours worked. And you can see that uh, there are 91 distinct entries in there. Um, and in the most common one is this missing value. This is actually this, uh, I said drop NA is false. If, if I get rid of that drop NA, uh, you can see that it doesn't put that in there. Uh, so, so just be aware of that. Um, sometimes missing values just get ignored. So, so the most common entry for hours worked is uh, that they didn't put uh, something in there. Um, you know, there was a question, someone said like, uh, missing values are the bane of my life. Um, basically, it's to paraphrase. Yeah, missing values are, are, are maybe somewhat problematic and we need to figure out uh, what to do with them. Um, in, in short, like I have a book, it's like dealing with missing values, I mean, that's not the name of it, but it's like um, it's like a statistical book that's like missing values and it's like that thick and it's like a textbook, right? So, so we could have like multiple discussions on dealing with missing values. Let me give you like a very short summary of, of, of what, what I recommend. Um, find out why the values are missing, talk to a subject matter expert and determine why the values are missing. Uh, because that might determine how you fix that, right? If you understand why the values are missing, it's much uh, easier to understand what the proper course is. Um, also, why, why do we even care about missing values? I mean, do we even care? Um, one main reason you might care is that a lot of machine learning algorithms don't like missing values and won't work on data that has missing values in it. So if you want to run a, a lot of machine learning algorithms, uh, like, for example, prin principal component analysis, uh, you, you need to deal with those missing values. They j the algorithms just won't work with missing values in them. Okay, so, so Pandas has some, some functionality for, for finding them and dealing with them. Uh, one of the things that I would do, you know, is ask, like, where are the values missing? Sometimes it's nice to see these in context. So one of, the, one of the 400 different things you can do with Pandas is this query method. This one's a little bit weird. Um, again, you can pull up the documentation for this. This one, you pass in an expression here, and... Um, this is a query string to evaluate. So this is kind of like SQL here. Um, and, and basically what I'm saying is uh, I've got this column, hours one, and I want to know where it is missing. So I can pass in this like, you know, where is it missing? And I actually put in the parentheses there. And when you run this, 
it, it gives you back, instead of 64,000 rows, it gives you back 27,000 rows, which should make sense, right? There should be 27,000 rows here, and these are the rows where this hours one is missing. So that might, you know, you can come in here and say like, okay, this person is 23, um, apparently they didn't work. This person is 70, apparently they didn't work. They might be not working for different reasons, right? One's 23 and one's 70 here. Uh, so that, that might be something to take into account. We also have like what their occupation is, what their major is. Um, and, and it looks like, you know, some of these are like, um, I just don't want to answer a lot of things, right? I refuse to answer that. No answer here, no answer here, no answer here. I'm not going to answer these things. I'll let you know my age and my, my race and my sex, but I'm, I'm not going to answer a bunch of other questions per se. So, you, you know, if you, if you have stuff like this, you know, maybe you want to drop it. Maybe you want to find out the other people who are in occupation 441 and see what they did. And you could come in here and you could do that. You could say, and uh, OCC is equal to 441. And here's everyone who didn't answer with 441. Can I find out which column is missing first? Yeah, which column is oh, which columns are missing values? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. I mean, we, we can go the other way here. We can say like, okay, um, let's summarize where values are missing. And so this is, this is my technique for doing that. I'm going to say is an A. Okay. So this gives me back a data frame. Um, same shape dimensions as the data frame, just has true false values in there. You see like hours is missing over here. And we want to summarize this. So, so here, here's a trick for you to put up your panda sleeve if you're not familiar with this. One of the maybe oddities with Python as a language is that Python treats true and false values as ones and zeros. This is just because when Python originally came out, didn't have Boolean values, so people did hacks where they made a variable called true and set it equal to one and false and set it equal to zero. Uh, it turns out that I can do things like this. I can say um, 42 plus false, <laughs> and that is 42. Uh, that, that's because if I convert uh, false to an integer, it converts to zero. I can also do things like this where I say 41 plus true, and that's 42. Okay, so when, so when, Panda, when Python added Booleans to the language, it actually preserved this capability of them acting like numbers, which if we have a Boolean data frame like this gives us actually a cool way to do some nice manipulation of this. So you can think of this as instead of being trues and false, you can think of it being ones and zeros. So if we wanted to find out the count of the missing values, what would we do to this? Yeah, we would want to summarize it, right? We can do an aggregation sum, which is going to remove a dimension. So watch what happens when I do this. Okay, so we're gonna remove a dimension. This is a data frame. What should the result of this be? A series. And if we look at this, this is a series. In the index are the column names, and uh, the values for the series are the counts of the values that are missing or that are true. Okay? So basically, anything that you can convert to a series, you just sum it, and uh, you can figure out, like, uh, you know, what percent of our age is. I mean, this doesn't have to be just NA, right? We can say GSS. Uh, and then say dot age, and we want to know, like, your boss wants to know, like, what percent of the age is greater than 50? And we can say, like, GT50. And so we have these true false values. Well, if, if we want the, the count of those, we can say sum those. That's the number, right? If we want the percent, we can actually get that really easy as well. Instead of doing the sum, we can do the mean. So if you think about this, this is a bunch of tr ones and zeros. If we want the average value of this, right, that will give us the percent. So how do you get the percent? You sum up the values and you divide it by the length of that, which is the mean. So in instead of doing this, if we say I want the mean, um, 
So, and you can multiply that by 100 if you want. Uh, instead of a fraction you want a percent 38 percent of our people are greater than than um than 50. right we can do that same trick down here we want to find the, the percent of values that are missing we just do the mean and multiply it by 100. okay and 42 percent of those hours are missing and uh 0.3 percent of age is missing The question is, when do I use query versus uh, loc? Um, yeah, so, so certainly I could do, so pandas is one of those libraries that has 400 different ways to do things, and a, a lot of those things overlap with each other, right? So I could do something like this where I could say, um, uh, query, and, and I could say, uh, let's do this, I want to say loc, and I'm going to pass in a Boolean array here, and I'm going to say GSS um, HRS1 is NA. And this, this actually gives me the same result as that query here. Um, so question is, like, which one of these do I prefer? Um, I prefer query generally. Um, it's a little bit weird in that this is a string, but l let me tell you why I, I like query. It's because when I'm doing a chain, oftentimes I have changed what I have, right? And here I'm referring to the original data frame here, but oftentimes in a chain, the original data frame doesn't even make sense to, qu to do a Boolean array on. Um, so notice here that this is not referring to GSS. Um, this is referring to whatever the current state of the data frame that this was called on is. So if I've done some maybe pivot table or something, I can use query to easily slice or, or filter that pivot table, which would be a little bit more difficult if I was using loc here. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, what is a valid query? I mean, basically, you're just taking that and putting it into a string. Um, if you want to, you can actually refer to variables as well. You can use an at sign to refer to variables. If your column names have spaces and then you put a back tick around them and then it works, so. Okay, the column names and then. And then whatever you do with a column name, right? Well, we don't worry, we'll join expressions that are valid column names. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can, people who are familiar with like SQL, uh, like you can do like SQL-esque things here, but you can also do like, we can, we can call up a, a, a pandas method in there if we want to as well. Okay. Okay, so, um, you know, we, we saw like, let's go back to what we had before here. Okay, so, so here you can see that, you know, we have some missing values here. Um, and, mi and maybe I want to dive into those a little bit more. Um, let, let's, let's look at like where age is missing. We saw that very few ages are missing. We see that like uh, ID 229 is missing, right? So maybe we want to say like, let's look at all ID 229s, right? Let's, happen, let's see what's going on with age there. And so it looks like there's a bunch of 229s here. Um, but if you look at this, this is kind of interesting. Here's, here's 1972's 229, um, which is a white male. Um, and then here's 1973's 229, which is a white female. And then here's 1974's. And, and this H is not this fine. This is 47. This is 38. The next one from 75 to 63. So um, you might think like the idea you know, is globally unique. And in this case, it's not, right? So, so what's going on here is basically every year they're sampling people, right? They're not sampling necessarily the same people. And, and so uh, by, by just doing this simple query and inspecting this, we can start understanding our data a little bit more even if we uh, didn't know this ahead of time, right? Maybe, the day, maybe if we read that 3,000-page book, we would understand that. But if, if we didn't read that 3,000-page book, uh, you know, by diving into these, we start to understand a little bit more about what's going on here. Okay, so um,
Okay. Yeah, I was going to have to go to Nintendo on that and blow on it. Um, okay, so, so, so at this point, I, I'm just going to say, let's convert hours work to an integer, and we're, we're going to convert uh, age to an integer as well. Let's try this and see what happens. And it looks like that worked, right? I mean, it didn't complain. We are using those pyro types, so presumably pyro would complain if that didn't work. Um, let, let's look at our memory usage now, and we're down to like 6.5. So I, I, the goal here isn't necessarily just to reduce memory usage, though that's a nice side effect, but the goal is to un also understand our data and make sure that we're using the correct types. By using the correct types, uh, you can often do operations that are a lot easier than they would be otherwise. Now, having said that, I said the goal isn't necessarily primarily to reduce memory optimization, to reduce memory usage, but it, but it could be. Um, pandas, pandas, the pandas library that you get from like pydata.pandas or whatever, um, it is an in-memory tool, right? And so in order to use pandas, uh, you need to be able to fit your data in memory. So if you can make your data smaller, you can often fit more of it in memory. You can off also do operations more quickly. Um, note that I said the, the pa Pandas library. Uh, like I said, I, I'm an advisor for a company called Ponder. Ponder lets you preserve the Pandas API. You change your imports but you can run your pandas code on BigQuery or Snowflake with the, with the same code, right? So pandas at this point is basically, it's a library, but it's also an API, um, and a, a Dask or other, uh, other Modin or other implementations. There's also a QDF, C-U-D-F, which is an implementation of pandas on um, GPUs that you can run your pandas code on the GPU. Yeah. Since we're talking about memory in detail, um, it seems to me that when you run this line 60, um, you have some memory somewhere, or it's sitting on the disk, I don't know where it is. It's, it's probably in memory. This GFS thing is already in memory. And now we're, you're doing another view, what I would call a view on this, which may create another copy of the memory. So now you've got two copies. One is 8 meg or whatever. Yeah. We've doubled. I mean, we don't. We haven't saved memory. We've actually just blown a bunch of memory. Yeah. The the comment is, uh, Matt, you're actually wasting memory. You're not uh, saving memory. Um, fair enough. Touche. Um, yeah. So so pandas is an in-memory tool. Um, I, I generally recommend that you have three to ten times the amount of m of memory as as the size of your data, so you have some overhead in uh, in places to. Um, uh, do some operations, right? Um, we'll talk more about this. Also, Pandas 2 uh, does have the notion of copy on write. Uh, so the idea there is we're not actually going to make a copy of it. We're going to use the same data unless we change it. So we don't, we don't make a ton of copies as we're going. Also, you'll note that as we're these doing these chainings, like this does make a copy. Uh, as does this makes a copy of whatever it is, but because nothing's pointing to those, we don't have references to those, they are garbage collected, so there's a spike in memory, but then it goes back down. Uh, that's one of the benefits you get from chaining is that you don't have intermediate variables that you're keeping around and that might be consuming memory that you otherwise wouldn't have. But yeah, it is in memory. Um, you do need to be aware that like, you have to have more memory than the size of your data with Pandas, the library, right? Like I said, there are other tools that might l allow you to get around that, that use the same API. Okay, um, I, I've got 9.30 here. Um, let's do a 10 minute break, let you stand up, stretch, go get a drink or go use the restroom. Uh, when we come back, we'll go over this flow exercise and then we'll keep going. Okay. Um, let, let's look at this float exercise here. What is the num the mean of the numeric columns? Um, I, I mean, I kind of gave that to you already. We can, we can just come in here and do a describe on this. And there's the numeric columns. We can get the mean of that. Uh, those values right in there. Um, 
If we wanted to, we could come in here and say mean. Uh, did anyone run into this error? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so th this is kind of a pa Python 2 uh, new thing. Um, scroll down to the bottom. It says that the arrow extension array with D type string, PyArrow does not support reduction mean. So basically what this is saying is like, I've got some string types in here, you're say, trying to say do mean on those, that doesn't work. Um, it says mean may be supported by upgrading PyArrow, I don't think that's the case currently, so I'm not gonna bother doing that. Um, there is an option in here to say numeric only is equal to true. Um, that should work. Uh, alternatively, uh, we could come in here and say select D types, and, and say, uh, I, I think we can say number. There we go, so there, there is number. And at this point, we should be able to say mean on that as well and get the same results that we got up there. Okay, questions about that? What questions do you have? What the, the results for this one after that moment? This commented out one. Okay, the next, the next one here is how many values are missing in the numeric columns? So uh, I, um, I, I kind of gave you that too as well. Um, GSS, um, so we could do a query, well, well we could do this. Um, we'll do select D types. Let's get our numbers and then we'll do a query. And um, we, we try and do like an is and a, that doesn't really work because we need to do that on a um, column, um, but we can just do is and a on a data frame. So query wants to work on the column, doesn't want to work on the, I mean we can't like say is and a in the query itself. So here is is and a, which values are missing, and then um, we want to count those, how many of those are. Uh, our trick here is to remember that these are uh, zeros and ones, true and falses, and so how do we get the count of those? We sum those up, okay? Um, so, so note that I am using this chaining here, and if, if you read the, you know, I, I could write this like this. Um, I, this is not particularly bad, but I don't recommend doing this. Um, remember that your brain has a limited capacity, and when you see this, you're, you're sort of saying, um, okay, a lot of stuff is going on here, and, and at the end I'm taking a sum here. Where if you change it, and you write it like this, uh, it's basically looking like a recipe. I'm starting with my data frame, I'm selecting the numbers, and then I'm seeing which one of those are missing. That's giving me a Boolean uh, data frame, a true-false values. I'm summing those up. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's let's look at non-numeric columns here. Uh, so in, in pandas one, if we wanted to look at the non-numeric columns, we would say object because pandas one really didn't have a string data type. And if we do this in, with pandas two using that that pi arrow backend, we get this data frame here. Uh, this data frame is not particularly interesting. Uh, it is a data frame with no columns. Okay, um, so yeah, you can have a, uh, this is a two-dimensional data frame with, with z uh, zero, zero uh, dimensions in one of the columns, which is kind of weird, but um, that's, that's what it's giving us. Uh, in pandas two, what we would say instead is we would say, let's select D types and we'll say string, and these are the string data types here. Okay, so, so we have like no answer, we've got uh, for a lot of these things, um, we've got like refused, no answer. Um, so l let's let's look at uh, what this looks like. Sadly, I didn't. This data set doesn't have uh, another common thing that we see as a string, which is like uh, when you load uh, dates in pandas, like from a CSV. Um, pandas by default for for dates is not going to 
do the right thing um, unless you tell it to, to convert those to dates. If you're reading from other uh, file formats that have date information encoded, it might be a little bit more intelligent about that. But so oftentimes you will need to take uh, strings and convert them to dates. And there's a two date time function that does that. Yeah, question, question like, why doesn't str work um, for, for select D types? Like, um, why can't I do this? And, yeah, I mean, not allowed, use, use object instead. And then if you use object, that doesn't work either. Um, I'm not sure. Um, th there are some pandas developers here. We could ask them, but I'm not. I'm not sure what. Yeah, I mean, I, this is one of those places where 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 it's like. I didn't step on it this time. Um, I, ooh. Um, this is one of those places where I think the interface is a little bit weird, right? Like, um, like the, here, here's these notes here. Um, maybe, maybe this will help. Yeah, so, so this actually isn't even correct for, for pandas, too. Uh, it says, to select strings, you must use the object in type, um, but note that will use all object types. So, so th they, sh they probably, for pandas, too, should have updated this even a little bit more. But yeah, but like this is like use np number or number for number types, right? I, I, I don't know where what where this, the spelling of these or the, those decisions came from. Uh, the question is, how did I pop up that help? Yeah, that's the doc string, right? I always go to the doc strings first. So I just put my cursor here, hold down shift and hit tab four times in Jupyter Notebook. In, in lab, uh, hold, hold, hold down shift and hit tab. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, so here, here's, my, here's my key, key, uh, method of the 400 methods. When I have something that looks categorical, I'm going to want to do value counts. In fact, I generally do this for most string columns. And going back to that question, there's a question like, can I just automatically convert all num number types to like the proper number type? Um, I mean, you could write something like that, but I, I, I strongly recommend like manually going through each column and cleaning it up as much as like that's like the bane of like data analysts or people everywhere because the more you understand your data, the better you're going to be able to answer questions. If you're making predictive models, make predictive models, explain to your boss why something is happening. So let's do a value counts on major. And again, I'm going to say drop NA is false here. And we get something that looks like that. Uh, so, so 80 it, it, uh, down here, we, we do see the ellipses here. So we have 81. Uh, entries there out of uh, 64,000, I believe. Um, uh, it looks like uh, the vast majority of them did not answer, right? Um, so uh, again, uh, in, in this case, like the no answer is actually encoded as a no answer. Um, it, it's not missing. This is like no answer. Uh, Apparently, well, I mean, there might be some some ones that actually were NA. I mean, we could we could check that here by doing something like this. We could say GSS major one is NA, right? And we get this boolean array here. It looks like it's all false, so we could say, okay, these are all false. Uh, but oh wait, there's 64,000 of them. We want to see all 64,000 and scroll through and find a true, right? No, right? So our spidey sense should go off. And what we can do, we, we've got a couple ways. We could say, let's sum these, right? That will tell us how many of them are true. Um, alternatively, we could say, is there any true in there, right? So any says, are any of the values true? If so, return a true. If not, return to false, right? Uh, we could also say mean to find a percent that, that's missing as well. 
Okay, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say let's convert this to a categorical type. So pandas, pandas one have this as well, a categorical type, and you know. We've got 64,000 entries here, um, but we only have 81 unique values. So uh, the categorical type is basically saying instead of storing values, all, all those separately, uh, just store the unique values and then basically store an index into those unique values. So let's do that for major one here. We just say as type category. Let's look at our memory usage. And um, our memory usage is like 7.8. So uh, you know, it, is that saving any memory? Yeah, it's saving a little bit, right? Um, we're saving a little bit by doing that. Okay, so again, object does not work. I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to I'm going to do this syntax here. So this syntax uh, is uh, kind of a, a interesting thing going on here. So this is using what's called a a dictionary comprehension here. Um, so I'm saying, let's loop over these columns here. And then I'm just going to make a dictionary mapping that column to category. Um, so that is a dictionary. But note that as type takes a dictionary. So what I'm doing is putting a double star in front of that. That's called dictionary unpacking. It's basically saying, stick this dictionary inside of this other dictionary. Um, why did I do that? Uh, because I'm lazy, right? Um, alternatively, I could come in here and say, like, sex, category, race, category, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm saving a few characters of typing by doing it with this dictionary comprehension, but it's also a pedagogical excuse for me to tell you about this. Um, this, this comes in, in pretty useful here. So let's, let's do this again. At this point, we're down to like uh, 3.7 megs. Note that the uh, in pandas one, when you read this in, you had like 36 megs. So we're using like a tenth of the memory uh, by being a little bit smart about what we're doing with our data here. Okay, um, so we're, we're going to uh, give you a little bit of time to do this next exercise here. So because we converted this to a categorical type here, let me just show you here. I'm going to. Sorry. Okay. So, so because we converted this to a categorical type, I'm gonna I'm gonna say like G two is equal to this, um, and let's just look at maybe major one. Oh, whoops, exactly, my bad, thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so, so here's major one. Um, if you look at the D type of this, it says category, and then it has uh, this list of categories here. So remember how we had like 41 different, or 400 things we can do on this. Um, that's not all the story. Uh, because we convert it to a category, there's a category accessor here, and on that, um, there's another like 20 things you can do on this. Um, so this exercise is an, a, a little excuse to play around with that. Um, there is a cat attribute on the category columns. Uh, what can you do with this attribute? It says use dir or tab to inspect. And then it says categories can be ordered. How would you order the income? So I'll let you play around with that for a little bit, see if you can order that income. Uh, see if you can use the documentation from Jupyter to figure that out. Um, also, in addition to the cat, guess what? There's also another accessor called string. Um, str and on that there's like another 30 things you can do with a string so I mean we're up to like 500 different things that you can do with with these at this point um, uh, and, and then our task with a string is to uppercase the values in the ticket column okay so I'll let you play around with that for a, a, a moment again if you need help or have questions let me know The, qu the question is like, what, what is category doing? Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, 
So, so if you think about like what's going on here, you can think about, okay, we're going to store the strings and maybe we have like a memory array where we say here's string one and here's the next one next to it um, and we could sort of keep those compact. Uh, a, a category instead of doing that is saying, okay, instead of storing strings there, we have 81 unique values. We're just going to make another data structure, maybe a list or something that has the 81 unique values in it in some order. And then we say, okay, uh, the first entry was uh, whatever, no answer, which is in position 56. So we're just going to store 56 in the categorical value. So instead of storing strings, which can have a lot of overhead, it might be like, you know, for Unicode, some number of bytes per character. Here we're saying, well, there's only 81 entries, so we can store that in an 8-bit integer, right? And we can store all of those values in an 8-bit integer pointing to this other data structure that holds the unique values. So then if we need to do an operation where maybe we uppercase all of the categories, we only need to do that to 81 values. We don't need to do that to 64,000 values. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I'll just wa walk around and uh, answer questions. Okay. Let's look at this. Um, so so uh, we, we've got this code up here. I'm, I'm just going to copy this and plop this down here. Um, so so I, I was talking with some of you and, and people are like, what, you know, I've heard that like you should never chain, and I'll talk more about chaining, but you can see that this chain, uh, I mean, this chain is not super long. It's actually just calling as type here. Um, but I didn't start off with this whole thing, right? I've been adding to it as I've been going along, right? So my chain is not like I sit down and like, bam, here's a chain, right? With, with I mean, you can look in my book here and there's like, a, a page of like, this is the whole code a, a, of a chain, right? And it's not like I just wrote down all that code at once, right? I'm iteratively, as I'm working with my data, building up this process to clean up my data or tweak it or whatnot um, and debugging it as I'm going. Okay, so, um, so at this point, like, there we've got um, uh, the cat uh, attribute and what can you do with this attribute? So, so uh, I, I think I built this G2 here, and we can say G2.dtypes, and you can see that like major one is a category. So I'm going to say major one, and then I'm going to say cat, and then it said like what what can you do with this? So you can add categories, um, you can change these to ordered categories, you can look at the categories, um, you can reorder them, or you can set the the categories. So, so, so uh, basically, if you have ordered categories, um, which is this next part, categories can be ordered. How would you order them? Um, it, it lets you uh, sort by categories. So let's say g2.income. And so we have like no answer. Uh, you can see that th these are the values down here. Um, if we were to say like G2, let's just do this here, like sort values. And we'd say like, I want to sort this based on income. And you can see that it's zero and then no answer. But it might be the case that there's like, a, um, if you look at the values for here, We can look at the unique values, and we'll convert that to a list because it, it's not showing all of them. So in this case, I kind of do want to see all of them. Well, you can actually see right here. Like um, it goes from like 1,000, then 10,000, then 15,000, then 6,000. So if I were to sort this, um, it, th this is not like numerically sorted, right? Um, like the 10,000 is going to be before 6,000 and 7,000, and the, uh, the 15,000 is going to be before that. So th that's not what I want. I, I would want to maybe sort it uh, so that num numerically it makes sense. Um, so, yeah. How did I get G2? Yeah. Um, yeah, I got G2 by doing this. Just this chain, the result of the chain.
Yeah. Okay. So um, let's, let's come in here and we can say sorted on that. There's the values. Um, and then what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something like this. So we'll take our data frame here and I'm going to say assign and we're going to assign uh, income to be uh, something like this. Um, so so let, let me talk about assign here. Assign is my way, my preferred way of making new columns or updating columns uh, in a chain. Um, note that I'm using a lambda here. I'm using a, a, a function. If you pass in, so, so this is the column we want to update or change or add. If you pass in a function here, uh, the it will this um, function will work on the current state of the data frame. So note that the current state of the data frame has categoricals here, and so um, I'm just saying ADF. This is the current state of the data frame, and I'm saying um, I'm going to take the category uh, and reorder the categories to um, these income cats. Which let me write out those. So how would I get those? Do something like this. Um, income. Okay. And so I'm going to throw one thousand, and then I'm going to throw this in here. So this is a little manual here, and then maybe I'll put no answer, whoops, at the front. Okay, so this, this is the income, I, again, this is from 1970. So, so these are actually ranges. This is like zero to 1,000, 1,000 to 3,000. This is like 25,000 plus in 1970 dollars. Um, so I'm just going to say I want to make the income now be um, this uh, this one that's categorical that is reordered and um, uh, like that. And if we look at income at this point. Um, It says that it is a category, and um, uh, with those types, um, that wasn't quite right. I actually need to to do this. Ordered is equal to true. So, um, if, if you did sort on that, it wouldn't it wouldn't really work. I actually want to do this. Ordered is equal to true, and if you look at at this now, it's got like. No answer is less than zero, which is less than 10. So at this point, if we did, um, well, we could do something like this. We could say, I want to group by we'll, sh we'll show group bys here in a minute. I want to group by income, and then I want the size of each income. You can see that this is in this order. If we didn't uh, order that, you can see that the order here is just this arbitrary order. This is actually lexicographical, right? This is alphabetic ordering here instead. So, th so this would be how uh, I, I could reorder those categories. Um, the next one, there's a stir attribute on string and categories. How do you access that? Um, again, we can do something like this. Uh, G2, and we'll look at major one, and we'll just say str and hit tab here. Uh, this, this, the string accessor allows us to do a lot of things very similar to what you do with a pandas string, or not a pandas, a python string. So if I say name is e equal to mat, uh, I can say name period, 
And a lot of these uh, methods are the same as they are in Python as they are in uh, Pandas. And there are some ones, some that are different, um, but a lot of them are the same. So this says, um, uh, how would you uppercase them? So let's just come in here and say uh, upper. Okay, it looks like that's in there. Um, we can pull up the documentation for that. It says it's equivalent to string.upper. Um, you can come down here. Uh, here is a series that has uh, these entries. I can say dot lower and it lower cases them. I can say dot upper and it returns a series where those are uppercased. Um, so let's do that here to uppercase the values in the ticket column. So I am going to say make sure our other ones working okay so I want to update a column and so to do that I'm gonna I'm gonna use the assign I don't have to make a new call to assign I can actually do this in the same call here so I'm gonna put comment after that one and we're gonna say ticket is equal to um, now in this case I, I I could if I wanted to I could refer to the original ticket and say str to upper um, you see that this now says no answer, as is if it were shouting that. Um, I would probably write this with a lambda, um, even though I strictly don't need to in this case. Why would I write it with a lambda? Um, if I were to insert code above this that changed the index here of the data frame, it would still work. It would be a little bit more robust. So again, the lambda is going to work on the current state of the data frame. In fact, um, if I put a lambda here, I could access this new income that's, category, that's a, an ordered category inside of that. Um, as of now, if I refer to GSS and I refer to GSS.income, it is the original income that's just a, a string. It's not even a categorical down here. So I, I would probably write this like this instead. Um, I get that there's a little bit of noise around the lambda there, uh, but once you understand that basically this is saying take the current state of the data frame and then do whatever you want on the current state of the data frame. In this case, I'm just uppercasing the string column. Let's run that and make sure that that works. It does work. And so this would be uh, the, the state of my um, chain at this point. Okay, questions, comments? Whoops. Okay, bugging for an integer. Okay. Okay. So so yeah. So um, our friend wanted to make uh, income as an integer value. So so let's do this. We're going to make income is equal to. I'm going to call it income underscore int. Okay. And let's sort of work through this, right? Um, so I'm, I'm going to say lambda uh, because I'm going to, uh, well, I don't, if I wanted to work on this categorical, I could, M maybe just for, for easiness, I'll just say, let's, let's take income here and uh, let's say as type and let's say int and uh, that doesn't look like that made pandas happy. It said, uh, nope, we can't do no answer. Okay, um, let's do, whoops. So it, it doesn't like the no answer, so uh, let's try and do replace. Um, no, was it no answer? How is it spelled? No answer. Uh, with np.nan. Okay, um, I'm, I'm just gonna do this and see if we can get this far. Okay, so, so this looked like this worked. Um, let's just scroll over to the side here. There it is. Um, in income int. So, so th there are a bunch of NAs there. Okay, um, let's look at the D types of this. And this is a, a string, Pyro string. So that's not what we wanted, right? We want it to be an integer here. So let's uh, try and convert it to an integer. 
and we get an error. Let's look at the error. It says you can't cast a pi arrow uh, D type to an int 64. Um, that's probably because um, it needs to be cast to a float. Let's see if we can do that. And no, we can't do that either. So th this is one of those weird things in, in pi arrow. Pi arrow is a little bit more difficult about this. Um, if we convert this to a, if this were a, sh let's just for fun, um, instead, I'm, I'm going to stick an as type str right here. So before I do the replace, I'm going to convert it to not a pi arrow string, but a, a naive, I call this a naive or a legacy pandas string. Um, um, Uh, this should work. As type str. Oh. There we go. Okay. So, so I've got this little chain going on here. Again, the, the, it, the, the key here is that, um, pi oh, never mind. I guess I was... Okay, let me try this. Pl pi arrow. I don't think we'll like. Um, okay. And we'll say in 64. Okay. So I misspoke. Apparently, I don't need to convert that to a, a string. So, so re replace um, no answer with nan and then uh, do the co conversion after that. Yep. Yeah, so, so this is gonna just say, uh, we're gonna replace, yeah, if we don't do the as type in here, This is a, a, a pi arrow. Pi arrow can have missing values in there. Okay. So, so that, that's just saying put, it, put in no answer with missing, missing values. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so at, at this point, um, what I would do is I would make a function with my chain. And, and I, my chain's a little bit shorter, so just for fun, maybe I'll take this long chain that we just made here, and I'll, I'll, I'll take this. So uh, I'm going to just copy this. And um, do something like this. And, um, and I could comment out this down here. Okay, and, and run that, and it says uh, some parentheses was never closed. Let's debug that. Um, okay. Okay, so here is um, my function. Uh, you know, I, I did comment out this other one, but it looks like it, it is working here. Okay, um, so let me let me talk about um, why I want to why I want to make a function. Um, so a, a lot of a lot of times when I'm um, teaching uh, people Python or data science. I come across a class of, 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 of people who are really smart people, and um, I ask, you know, how many of you were trained as computer scientists or have like a computer science degree? None of them. How many of you are programmers? Some of them might sort of raise their hand, but a lot of them are like, I don't want to be a programmer. Like, I'm not a programmer. Like, okay, whatever. Um, but they're like, I am a scientist, okay? And I'm like, that's fine. You are a scientist. 
Um, but basically, you're acting as a programmer, right? And so as much as you don't want to be a programmer, uh, my job is to covertly teach you programming best practices and make you as a scientist use these programming best practices even though you're not a programmer, right? We get that you're not a programmer, that's fine. Um, and so one of the things that programmers don't like is global variables, right? A and it turns out that like Jupiter, as nice as it is, is basically like making global variables all over the place and we're just like, oh, let's make more global variables, right? Problem is, is that makes it really hard for someone to like come back and understand what's going on. The other thing that's hard about Jupiter is that like I can run like all these 20 cells and then like I'm like, oh, I forgot to do something. So I'm gonna come up 15 cells, make a new cell, insert something, and this new cell that I, I inserted actually refers to code 10 cells below it, but it works for me, right? because I just ran that code down here, then I came back up here and inserted this code. Uh, the problem is, is like, that doesn't work for you tomorrow or next week or your colleagues when you give them your notebook. It's like they get to that cell that refers to the cell down below and it's like, this doesn't work, right? And, and, and so uh, that makes life less fun. And so what I like to do is, I note, note that this chain is not spread across multiple cells. Could you spread across multiple cells? Certainly you could, right? It's basically everything's crammed in there in one place. Um, also, there are, aren't intermediate variables, right? There's not all of these global variables sticking around. There's like a function. Um, so what I can do is I have this function, and I like to stick this function at the top of my notebook. And so then the next time I come to my notebook, I don't have to go through and find the 50 different cells and cross my fingers, do my rain dance, and make sure that I run them in the correct order. I just run my imports and then run my code to do whatever it's doing, and I'm good to go, right? I don't have to try and divine what was happening 50 days ago when I did my notebook. It just, just sort of works. Also makes it really easy if I am working with an a uh, programmer who wants to deploy this into production or something, they can take the code, they can write tests for it, they can deploy it um, because they're used to doing functions, they're not used to having these global variable things. Okay, so that's my little rant about making functions. Um, n you know, a lot of people see this, they're like, oh, this is a mess or this is hard to do. Um, I get that like there's a lot going on here, right? But if, if you step through it, it's like, okay, what am I doing? Here's my thing that's passed in, I'm changing the types, right? What am I doing down here? I'm making a new column, and I'm reordering the categories. What am I doing down here? I am uppercasing this one, right? If I wanted to, I could reformat these if I wanted to. What am I doing down here? Well, our, our friend wanted to convert it to numbers, so I'm converting that to numbers, right? Um, so it is a lot of code. It's all in one place, but if, if you s sort of step back and look at it, it should be somewhat um, uh, self-explanatory what's going on there. It should read like a recipe. Okay, um, so here is our next exercise here, which is rearrange your notebook. I want you to put the imports and the code to load the raw data and the tweak function at the top of the notebook, then restart your notebook, i.e. kill your kernel, and then run it and make sure that it works. This is what you should be doing before you hand off a notebook to someone else, right, and say, I want you to work on this with me. You should run through your notebook and make sure that your notebook works. In this case, we only have to run like two cells, right? We run our imports and we run this code to load our data. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to do that. If you need help or have a question, let me know. Lambda there. Generally, I, I do like to use lambdas here, so let's let's just replace this with a lambda and see if it works here. I'm just going to plop that, copy that, and paste that here. Um, and it looks like that does work. Um, so, so again, uh, a sign is going to let us make a new column or override an existing column, and you can put a series on the right-hand side of the equal statement here, or you can put a function. And if you put a function, it is going to pass the current state of your data frame, whatever uh, this was called on, into that function as the first parameter of it. So um, in this case, um, 
this income here is actually this income that was uh, defined two lines above it. Right? When I left this as GSS, this was the original just pi arrow string income. It, uh, it happens in order. It's not necessarily the line. I, I do have it in line, but it is, it is the order. It is the order, which is actually useful if you have, like, you might have a column that depends on two other columns, right, that you just made in your assign. Um, you can have access to those two new columns that you just made. Uh, the question, could this just be the column income? Um, let's try it. Okay. In this case, it, it, it won't let us do that because we already had an income. So if we really wanted to do that, what I would do is I would put another assign. I would copy this and put another assign call right here before that. Now, th this is actually a Python syntax issue because these are, it, it's basically pandas is hijacking the keyword parameter names as the column names and Python won't let you have a, a parameter, two parameters that have the same name. Good questions. Other questions? Okay, so... somewhere around there. For some reason, I'm getting a 1.6, and I'm just wondering, I just feel like the memory, it must be a platform specific thing, but yeah, I got left. Yeah. So we want to look at the memory of this. Yeah. Uh, minus the incoming. OK. Um, yeah, so, so I believe, um, let's see if this ticket, what the D types of that is. It, it might be converting that to a, a Python, let's see what ticket is. Yeah, so, so look at that. Um, I think this is a regression on uh, the Pyro, right? So this, sh this should be, this should, I would prefer this to stay as Pyro. Yeah, but uh, maybe we can we can look at that uh, offline or after the class. Okay. Okay, so, so here is my function. Let me just show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to say C. Uh, that will copy this whole cell in, in Jupyter. Um, and I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to plop this r right up here, uh, V. And then uh, I actually want my imports here. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to say C, and I'm going to plop this down here. And then um, I need to load my raw data. So I'm going to find out where that GSS is equal to, which is right here. And I would, I, this is how I would do it. I would do something like this. I would say this is not GSS. This is GSS raw. And then I would say GSS is equal to uh, tweak GSS raw like this. Okay, I'm gonna, so, so here, here's my code. I'm gonna restart my kernel. So I'm gonna say zero, zero twice. It will ask me to restart my kernel. I've lost all of my global variables at this point. Um, I'll run this first one that looks like it works and I'll run the second one and that looks like that works. At this point I have GSS raw, which is the raw data and I have this GSS, which is, uh, should have my uh, uh, slightly changed uh, types here. Okay, uh, why do I keep, 
why do I want the raw? You don't have to keep the raw around. Uh, what I found is that invariably when I've done some analysis or a, a model, a predictive model, my boss comes or my client comes and says, will you explain what's going on here, right? And so if I have this chain, it's very easy for me to trace what's going through to every line and see what's going on there. Um, and I'm working with the raw data, right? And everything is in that chain. If I'm, if I'm not working with raw data, or I'm working with some, you know, someone's spreadsheet that they've manually changed, or I've got like all these cells where like I've met, manipulated the code, it's very hard to track what's going on here. So this chain is gonna make it so uh, my life is a lot easier uh, when invariably my boss comes and starts probing for questions. Okay. Um, so some things I might do as well, I might do something like this where I, I might rename my columns. Um, so like HRS1, I might like change that to hours underscore worked. I do like to, um, generally I will leave my columns as like valid Python parameter names, meaning that I don't put spaces in them or non-alphanumerics. If I need a space, I'll put an underscore with that. It just makes it slightly easier to use in like Jupyter, um, where tab completion will work on a column. If I have like a space in a column name, uh, it, like Jupyter tab completion will break on that. Okay, questions? Questions about that? So that, that is a practice that I think if you if you aren't doing that, just take, and you don't even have to chain per se. Like, I get that like chaining, a lot of people have this visceral reaction to chaining when they see this long chain of code. They're like, oh, this is like too much for me, right? You don't even have to chain, but if you will take your code and put it into a function where it does all of your steps and then put that at the top, it's gonna make it really easy to come back to your notebook and keep going where you were rather than having to run 50 different cells to get to that state. Okay, um, so I'm gonna rant about chaining now. If, if this bothers you, I apologize. Um, chaining, like it says here, is also called flow programming. Um, um, rather than making these intermediate variables, we are just gonna say pandas generally returns series or data frames so I'm just gonna take the return of the result and keep manipulating that until I get what I want. I don't really care about intermediate variables. Like, a lot of people are like, Matt, what do you do with the intermediate variables? How do you look at them? I don't care about them. My goal is to take the input and get the data into a form that I like. I look at the intermediate variables along the way. Note that I don't just come up with this chain and go, bam, here's a chain. I mean, maybe with chat, we might be doing that in a year or two. But right now, this is a manual process. I am building it up as I'm going, right? I'm looking at those intermediate variables. I'm double checking it as I'm going, but I'm not keeping them around. I don't want them around. They're just taking up memory and I'm not going to use them. I care about the input and the output, not what's going on in the middle. Uh, this is from a okay, ago, sorry. sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the comment is uh, like it, with read CSV, there's the ability to like skip rows based on a lambda function. Uh, does PyArrow support that? No, it doesn't. Right. So, so that would be an issue where PyArrow is is not as flexible as um, uh, the the Python backend. If if you need that. Um, you can not use the Pi Arrow backend, uh, or sorry, let me rephrase that. If you need that, you cannot use the Pi Arrow engine, right? That reads the CSV. You can use the Python engine, and still get Pi Arrow types if you want to. And I, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, the assign method. Uh huh. You mentioned a way to get around if you have spaces in your column names. Uh, 
Okay. So the, the comment, I think, or I'll let you finish. No, that, no, that was it. I was, yeah, I around that. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you really want spaces in your column names, how do you do that, right? So, so these don't have spaces. If I try and come down here and I say, like, I want um, to say income space int, right? If I do that, I'm going to get an issue here, and it says this is invalid syntax because this, again, is hijacking Python's parameter name and trying to use that and parameters can't have spaces in them. They have to be valid Python attributes, which means alphanumeric can't start with a number and can have an underscore in them, right? So if I want to get around that, um, I can do that. It just is a little bit of syntax. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this into a dictionary and then use dictionary unpacking to unpack my dictionary into parameters. And that's a way you can get around that. Let me show you how to do that. Um, so let's convert this into a dictionary. Um, so it's not converted into a dictionary right now. Um, I need to put this into a string. And then I need to put a colon here. Okay, if I run this, it's still not going to work. Um, it says positional argument follows keyword argument. That's because this is a dictionary now. I need to actually unpack it. So the unpacking syntax is to put a double star in front of that. It's basically saying I want a keyword named income space int to be equal to this. Yeah, Python doesn't complain about that. It's actually okay with that. So um, there it is, income space int. So, so there is a little bit of syntax to do that, but if you, if you need to do that, you throw it into a dictionary. Yeah, so, so this, this here is unpacking a dictionary into another dictionary, right? This is inside of this dictionary right here. This is, so this is like doing something like this. Let me... So if I have a function at x, y, return x plus y, and I have like x is equal to um, 5 and y is equal to 10, I can say add x, y, right? Th that works. Um, I can also do this. I can say add, and I can say uh, I have a dictionary. Well, let's just say I have um, args is equal to a dictionary uh, where x is equal to 10, and y is equal to 5, I can do this. Add star star arcs. So, so that's what I'm doing. Um, in this case, um, you know, it does have a space in there, but um, uh, it, it, Python's fine with that. This is what we're concerned with, yeah. So, so let me let me go through that process one more time, just just so we understand it. Um, I'm going to take this here, and we wanted this to be a space, right? Python doesn't like that. That's invalid syntax. So I'm going to convert this into a dictionary. So here is the key, and the value of that dictionary is this lambda function on the other end. Okay, and then I need to unpack that dictionary. So if I put a star star in front of that, that's basically saying here is the name of the parameter and here is the value of the parameter. Okay, Okay, back to my rant uh, on chaining. Good question. Um, okay, so, 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 so f you know, some folks are hung up. I, I post this, like if you follow me on Twitter, this is not a surprise to you. I, I, I post content like this and it's a good way to get eyeballs because this drives people up the wall. Um, <clears throat> so a, as you can see, I, I built this chain as we were going through. I didn't just come up with this chain from scratch. Um, if you want the intermediate state, you can get that. I'll show you how to get that. Um, 
But I think this reads like a recipe and it's a lot easier. Um, compare and contrast that with this. This is uh, sort of what most people do, um, where they're making a bunch of variables. And then they probably get like some setting with copy warning. Has anyone ever gotten that? OK. And then you search for how to deal with that. And you read like five articles. And you still don't understand what it means. OK. Um, yeah. If you use a sign with chaining, you will never see that warning. It won't happen, um, and you won't have to deal with that. Also, like you know, people will do this, but they'll have it like spread apart, fifty different cells or whatever. And I get the like, you're basically doing the same thing that I'm doing with chaining, um, which, which is fine. But you just need to take that step of like refactoring it and, and cleaning it up a little bit. Um, so, also I, I will note that like. Most pandas developers, like people who work on pandas, um, are fans of chaining. I think one of the reasons like chaining isn't uh, super well known is because you have a lot of what I would call like blog spam by certain bl blogs or uh, aggregators of content, of, let's say, where it's like 20 f methods you should know with pandas, right? And it's like method one, uh, method two, method three, right? And it's showing all you all these methods in isolation. And I don't use a method in isolation, right? I, I mean, maybe if you're in some fairyland where you get clean data, I've never been in that fairyland. I'd love to be there. But I don't use methods in isolation. I have to do multiple steps to my data to get cleaned up for my clients, right? And, um, and so it's nice to know about these 20 useful pandas things, but in the real world, they are used in combination with other operations as well, right? They're not used as one line code. So um, uh, w one more note on chaining, right? Um, this isn't a class about pullers, but there's another library called pullers, which is a data frame library that um, has some advantages. It's also built on PyArrow that uh, looks kind of like pandas. If you use pullers, you basically have to use chaining. And the reason why well, you don't have to, but if you don't, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. The reason why is that Polars is smart and it has a query planner like a database engine where it actually go through and look at all the operations that you're doing and it can know by the last thing in your chain whether to read all of the columns from the CSV or to filter out rows from a CSV. So it can start from reading a CSV to the final thing. It will look at all the operations you're doing. It says, like, I can skip these rows. I can skip these columns. I don't even need to read them in, right? Because of the chain allows it to understand what's going on through the whole process. Pandas doesn't have that currently. Will it have that in the future? It might. I mean, like, the people who are working on, like, Ponder and, and Modin, like, that's something that would be possible um, by doing chaining. If you don't do chaining, right, you don't, you don't get the advantage of like taking advantage of a query engine to make your code run faster for free. Okay, so um, here is uh, our function. There's the other one. So, so people are like, how do you debug this, Matt? And um, that's another common question I get, like how do you debug this? I mean, I also get ones like, I don't like a dictionary in the middle of this, right? Like I, I would call that, you know, there in, in Programmers have a thing that we call magic numbers, right? A magic number is a number that just appears in the middle of your code that had meaning to someone when they wrote the code uh, at the moment they wrote it, but probably not at any other time or to any other person, right? So if you just see a number sitting around in code, you're like, what does that number mean? Who knows, right? It's, it, it worked, though. Um, so, so oftentimes we would, we would like to like at least make a variable name pointing to that magic number that's descriptive of what that number is, right? And so some people are like, I don't like this dictionary literal. Like there's just a huge dictionary just like in there and I don't know what that is. So I'd be fine like saying like, okay, here's my types dictionary and I make a variable right here called like column types and then I just say as type column types right here and put it in there, right? To me that's like, Whatever. I mean, it, it, to some people, it, may, it placates them, right? I've also had people say, like, you're returning a big thing. I don't like that you're returning a big thing. <laughs> OK, I mean, I can make a variable and then return the variable below that, right? Um, 
But those are, those are like the complaints that I get. All, all other ones are like I can't debug it, right? So if I wanted to debug a chain like this, how would I debug it? Probably I would use like a poor man's way of debugging it first of all. I would literally comment out everything and walk through it line by line. Basically recreating the steps that I did to do it and look at what's going on as, I'm, as I uncomment those, right? Um, However, if you want to get fancy, you can get fancy, and there's a method, one of the 400 methods, called pipe, okay? What pipe allows you to do is you pass in a function, and the function can take, well, the function takes in the current state of the data frame, and it can do whatever it wants. Um, generally, when I write a function for pipe, I will return the data frame at the end of it so I can keep chaining. Um, so let's, let's leverage that. I'm going to make a function called get var because for whatever reason I want to get the intermediate state of my data frame because that really is important to me to get the intermediate state. Um, uh, again, I, I don't care about the intermediate state, but some people apparently do. Um, so here is a function called get var. Notice the first parameter to it is the data frame, right? So that's the interface that you need to use if you're going to use pipe. And then I just have another parameter here. It's called variable name. And I'm going to use the built-in Python globals, which gives me access to the global variables. And I'm going to say, I want you to make a variable name that is the current state of the data frame and points to it. And then I'm just going to return the current data frame because I want to keep chaining. Okay. And then look at what I do right here. Here I say, here's my data. And I'm going to call pipe. I'm going to pass in my function. And I'm going to pass in the variable name that I want to be stored. Okay. And when I run this, um, and I come down here and look at DF3, there's the current state of the intermediate variable if I want that. Okay. Um, note that I also used another thing that I think is actually useful here. Um, I'll talk to this side of the room. Uh, so. so I used pipe here, and I just put, I used a lambda this time. You don't have to use lambdas, but you can, right? You just need to pass in the data frame as the first parameter here. And I'm just saying, print the shape of my data frame. And then I'm saying, or df. This is a short circuit in Python. Um, because a lambda is somewhat um, limited in, in functionality, basically this is saying, return the data frame. It's, it's a hack to return the data frame from here. Um, but what this allows me to do is when I run this code, I can say, what is the current shape of the data frame at this point, right? And there's 64,000 rows and 14 columns. In this case, um, I've inserted these at various locations here just to sort of debug. There's not really much going on here, but you could imagine if I'm merging this with another data frame or I'm adding columns or filtering columns, it might be useful to see what the shape of the data is as I'm going through my pipeline. Uh, especially useful if you do a merge and you have like some combinatoric explosion where you have a many to many and you're not sure where all the data, where all the rows started coming from. Using something like this can help debug that. Okay, so we're, I'm going to give you a chance to play around with pipe for a little bit. Um, I want you to write, actually, let's do a break. Let's do a 10 minute break. Let you stand up and stretch, and when you get back, you can play around with, with pipe for a little bit. Okay, so I think for the sake of time, because I want to get to the other part, we'll, we'll do this part together. Um, so uh, this is a write a function that accepts a data frame and an index value. It should print any rows that match the index and return the data frame that's passed in. So again, this is sort of like I want to maybe you want to track some row as it's going through and seeing what happens to that row as we go through the chain. And, um, so, so let's do that. Um, I make a function called track rows. And because we're going to be using it with pipe, we want to say data frame as the first parameter. Generally, I'll, I'll say like data df underscore. It's just a convention I like. Sometimes I'll use like ADF, um, which are, are like variables that I wouldn't use 
for storing a variable, for storing a data frame. I get that like naming is hard and like DF, DF1, DF2 are probably the most common variable names that we use. Um, but generally I'm gonna use DF underscore when I'm using like a Lambda to refer to like the current state of the data frame rather than like I'm gonna make, I wanna make a variable called DF underscore in the real world, right? So this is just a hint to me when I see this variable that this is the current state of the data frame. It's not necessarily that I'm making it this variable to store something. And then I wanna pass in some indexes. So I'm just gonna say indexes like this, probably maybe spell it this way, indices, if I wanna be pedantic. Okay, um, and what does it, it, it prints out rows that match the index. Um, so I, I'm going to say display. I imported the display function. Actually, you don't even need to import it in Jupyter. You just get it for free. Um, so I, I'm just going to say display df underscore, and then I'm going to use uh, loc here, and I'm just going to say whatever indices were passed in, uh, just display those rows, and then return df underscore. Okay. Um, so, so let's try this out and uh, I'll just try this out here. Um, um, so I'm going to say track rows and, um, if you want to, when you're using pipe, you can actually use the keyword arguments. That sometimes makes it clearer. Note that I am passing in the function here, track rows. I am not calling it here. I'm passing that function into pipe. Pipe will call it for me under the covers. And let's just say that I want indices to be one, uh, 1,000 and 60,000. Note that I'm using a Python 3 syntax. Uh, Python 3 supports putting underscores in arbitrary locations in, uh, in, in, um, in numeric literals. Um, I like to do that just to make this clear that this is 60,000. It's just a little, remember I want to make my code easy to read. Um, okay, so let's put that pipe in here. Uh, let's put another pipe right here. Um, we'll comment out this one and then we'll put another one at the end here. Okay, let's run that, and there we go. Here's the first one, uh, 1, 1,000, 60,000. Here's the next one, 1, 1,000, 60,000. Here's the third one, 1, 1,000, 60,000, and here's the return result here. In this case, not very much interesting. It's happening to those as we go through them, but it, hopefully this gives you an idea for tracking through your data and seeing how you could change that if, if you want to. Oh. Yeah, that was the next part. Show rows two and 64883. I just, I just did these instead. Um, will you end up uh, saving this and putting it somewhere where we can have a list of all the people saying you tried today? Sure. Yeah. Um, email me or, f or DM me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I'll put it, I'll put it on a GitHub gist. So, so question is, when do I use loc? So loc and iloc are used to pull out rows or columns or both. Um, so if, if I need to pull out rows or columns based on the name, generally loc is a good thing to do. Um, if, if I need to do some Boolean array, right, and I just want to filter rows, then I would use query to do that. If I want to pull out rows or columns based on position, like sometimes I want to say like, I want the last 10 rows and the last 20 columns, then iloc would be a good thing to do because that's based on position. So those are some rough rule of thumbs, right? Loc and iloc allow you to filter uh, both rows and columns. Query allows you to filter rows. Okay, and as, as you know, as much as I like chain, there are places where chain, uh, you don't, you can't chain, right? You might have to create two variables and you have a derived variable that define, that's derived from those. So sometimes like chaining is not um, the only way to do things. 
OK, uh, another thing about uh, pandas is mutation. So uh, pandas does have um, a, a lot of the 400 uh, methods in pandas have an in-place parameter. And so a lot of people, especially that see these blog posts about 20 things that you can do with pandas, they show like using in-place is equal to true. And they're like, OK, if I use in-place is equal to true, I'm not returning a data frame. I'm mutating the data frame, so I'm saving memory. And it turns out that that's actually not the case. I have a quote here from Python core developer. Generally, what happens if you look at the implementation under the covers is when something is called with in place, it makes a copy under the covers and just uh, changes the pointer under the covers. So you don't really save memory, per se, because it's making the copy there. Um, in, in fact, there's a bug here. The bug is to get rid of in place because, in general, it prohibits chaining and it's not, it's kind of misleading. It's not doing what people think. Uh, also, like I said, Pandas 2 does introduce this notion of copy on write, which um, is when you're returning a data frame that's derived from another one, you can return the original data as long as it hasn't changed. And if you change some data, you only update the data that's changed. You don't copy the whole data. Um, so, uh, if you see people using in place is equal to true, to me that's an anti-pattern. Your spidey sense should go off. Um, I don't think they're doing things the right way. Okay, another, another common, one of the top 20 things that you can do with Python posts is using apply. Uh, apparently when people see apply, they think, oh, this is the coolest thing since sliced bread, and they want to tell the world about it. Um, so here, here's an example here. Um, let me run my code here. And, and let's say that I want to convert age to months, right? So look at this. This is so awesome. I can make a function here called two months that takes a value and multiplies it by 12, right? That's pretty cool, because then I can say age.apply two months. Well, that looks like it works, right? Um, and it does work like it does the right thing. The issue here is that this is crossing uh, the boundary that makes pandas fast and moves it to the boundary that makes pandas slow. So remember, Python is a slow language, but we have like this numpy functionality or pi arrow functionality. If we stay inside of that, pandas is fast. It's basically like C. Um, when we're doing something like this, we're saying apply two months. We are passing this function in here, and pandas is going to pull out each individual value from that convert it to a Python object, call that Python function, and then push the value back. So that's a slow operation. So even though the blog posts tell you to do that, you shouldn't do that. Um, for example, we can do the same thing by just saying take age and multiply that by 12. You get the same result here, but this is what we would call a vectorized broadcast operation. So pandas is smart. And uh, taking advantage of this, what it can do is it can say, take that 12, here's a block of numbers under the covers. There's like special CPU instructions called SIMD instructions. And say, I, want, I have a block of numbers that are stored in memory, and I want to multiply every value in that by 12. Just do that, and it can do that in one CPU instruction without pulling it across, converting it to a Python object, and then sticking it back in. <clears throat> So I've just got um, some timing. So you can use the time it uh, cell magic here. On my machine, it's like 42 times faster to do it uh, the right way. Um, now, now one place where uh, apply, m so yeah, uh, 113 microseconds versus four milliseconds. Um, so yeah, something like 42 times faster, which is convenient because 42 is the answer to everything. Okay, um, so, so one place where it might, um, I, I should be slightly less cynical, um, so one place where like apply might work is with string operations. How, however, with uh, pi arrow, uh, the string operations are getting much faster here. So here I'm saying apply with major one, is it science? Um, um, we get 234 microseconds. If I do an is in, um, I get 468, right? So this would be like the non-apply version that would be like how, how you should do in pandas. That's actually slower than apply here. 
Um, uh, no, this is kind of weird here. If um, college major, I converted it to a category, and um, it's actually kind of slow as well here, so which is slower than the string. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Generally, that's faster. Um, but um, th that's a kind of a recent change. So, so here, here's my rule of thumb. If you're doing numeric operations and you're using apply, your spidey sense should go off. If you're doing it with strings, it might be okay. Um, generally, what I would do is I would uh, benchmark it. One, one note to be aware when you're benchmarking it, benchmark on the size of the data that you'll be using in production. Don't benchmark it on some small subset of data because you might often get different results and it might uh, impact your speed. You're is in as much faster. Yeah, maybe it's just that uh, Python and pandas hate Macs. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, it might be like an optimization that hasn't made it to M1s. I'm not, I, yeah. Um, I, I haven't looked into that. So, so, um, the point holds for numbers, right? For for strings and categories, that might be different. So just, uh, I would say, uh, be aware of that benchmark it on the size of the data if um, that is an issue. Okay, again, we, we are getting close to time here. So um, I, I, I'm gonna, let, let's do this apply one just together. If you, we'll do like mass pair programming here. Um, so make a new column called minutes worked derived from at the hours worked column. Um, so again, I would probably do something like this. Um, we'll just put it into our chain here. Okay, so we're gonna make a new column called minutes worked um, derived from the hours worked. So how do I do that? I'm gonna come down here and say assign and if I'm gonna call it minutes underscore worked, um, I'm gonna say lambda, take the current state of my data frame, I'm gonna say df underscore and take hrs1 and multiply it by 60, okay? So I, I don't need to do an apply there, I should just be able to multiply that by 60. Uh, apparently that didn't work, um, hrs1. Oh yeah, I should read my code here. It's called hours worked. Um, thank you. It's always nice to have a bunch of virtual compilers checking my code. Um, hours worked, hours named, hours worked. Thank you. Okay, um, so there's hours worked and um, scroll over, there's minutes worked. Okay, that looked like that worked. Okay, the next one here is a little bit more complicated. Make a new column called income ratio. Convert the income columns to numbers. Replace no answers and refuse with mp.nan. Uh, fill in the missing values with the median and divide the 2006 value by the 1970 value. Okay, so I'm gonna put this into a function here. Um, I'm gonna call it def calc income ratio and it's gonna take a data frame here and um, we're gonna stick this into here. I'm gonna say uh, income ratio is equal to calc income ratio, okay? And um, what do we want to do? We want to, uh, so we've got the income 1970. So I'm gonna call this um, Income 70 is equal to uh, DF underscore uh, income 1970. And I want to replace no answer with NAN. Uh, 
um, with np.nan. And let's convert that to an integer. And let's return this. So let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, we've got a value error. So let's see what it says here. It says it cannot convert NAND to an integer. Um, that's uh, because I, I'm using the um, naive type. Let's try and do this in N64 uh, pi arrow. Let's see if that works. Okay, so that, that looks like that did work. Um, okay, so 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 I'm okay. So I, I, I believe that that is a number here. Um, let's do the same thing for um, the two thousand six value. So if I wanted to, could I like stick these back in the columns? Yeah, I could stick them back into the columns if I wanted to. Um, and let's do return 2006. Okay, we got an error here. Um, it says uh, refused, it can't convert refused. So apparently there's a refused in there. Um, so I'm just going to come in here and say replace refused. with np.nan. Okay, so that looks like that works. Um, so uh, we, we've converted them to numbers. We want to fill in the missing values with the median, and we want to divide the 2006 by the 1970 value. So I might do something like this, where I might say, um, take income 2006, uh, fill NA with income 2006.median, and divide that by income 70, fill NA with income 70 dot median. Okay, and just looking at the ratio of, of those values, it looks like, looks like that works. Okay, so you can see that I did not use chaining here. It's not that I have to use chaining everywhere. Could I have done this with chaining? Yeah, I could have. Um, I could have either replaced these columns with that. I was a little bit vague about whether I should replace those columns. Um, I could create new columns, and then I could delete those columns if I needed to. In this case, I'm just making two temporary variables and doing the operations and then returning them. Leave that on the screen. Let me know if there are questions or concerns. And again, I, I could probably make this more readable by putting this on multiple lines, writing it more as a recipe rather than one long line of code. Yeah. Question is uh, whether this is vectorized right here or if this is a play. Yeah, so this is just taking this column, right, and multiplying the column by 60, right? So this column is a pi arrow number, and when you multiply a pi arrow number, that's a vectorized operation. Other questions? Uh, the question, is this vectorized? Um, is calc income ratio vectorized? Um, so I'm not sure what uh, Pyro does under the covers with that, right? Um, we're converting it to an integer. So you probably have some slowness here with that conversion from, from string to integer. Uh, not necessarily vectorized per se. But this down here is probably vectorized, fill it fill in the missing values with the median. Um, it can probably do that relatively quickly. This division would be vectorized. So you, you're taking two series and dividing them. That, that's a vectorized operation.
<clears throat> okay. Um, our, for our last section, we're going to talk about uh, aggregation. And I like to say that these are the things that your boss wants. Right? So imagine that you work at a candy store and the boss comes in and says, how are we doing? The boss doesn't want to know. We sold one lollipop and two Tootsie Rolls and a piece of gum to Sally and then Billy came in and we, he bought two uh, trinkets and then he bought a soda and then he bought two candy canes. Your boss wants to know, there were 52 people who came into the store yesterday. They bought $1,286. The average purchase price was $28.52, right? So your boss wants aggregations, meaning you have data, you are collapsing it, right? Um, and, and oftentimes you might have multiple dimensions where you're collapsing it. In that case, we're doing a grouping or a pivot for those who are familiar with Excel. And so once you understand how to transform these sorts of questions into pandas operations, you can answer your boss's questions relatively easy. Now I get that some of the syntax here might be a little bit confusing, but let's explore some of the functionality in pandas. So for example, I'm going to say, um, Let's compare age by sex by year for this GSS data, right? Um, what does age looks like um, by sex by year? So when I see like by year or for year, that tells me I need to do a grouping on that, right? So I need to group by year. And one of the 400 things you can do in pandas is group by. So I'm going to say group by year and at that point, Pandas is going to take all of the entries that have the same year, and then we need to do an aggregation to collapse those, right? So the aggregation is mean um, in this case. So let's do that. And uh-oh, it did not work. Um, why didn't it work? Because PyArrow is uh, pedantic. It's like, I don't, I don't know how to, uh, uh, cat how to do a mean with a category. Okay, so to get around this, this is kind of like a pandas2 thing, uh, we can say numeric only is true, like only do means on the numbers. And we get something that looks like this. So this is a pandas data frame coming out of this, right? In this case, the index is actually more interesting than all the indexes we've looked at so far. Um, well, I guess the describe indices were interesting. In this case, the index is what we grouped by. So whatever we grouped by, Group by year, that went into the index and all the numeric columns, we have the mean value for all of that. That's pretty cool. I mean, the, you could write this as one line of code. I wrote it as like four lines of code, but uh, pretty powerful stuff that you can do relatively easily to answer your boss's questions. Now, um, alternatively, if I didn't want to say numeric only, I could use some syntax like this, which is a little bit weird. People th think that this is like a, a a nested list. This isn't a nested list. This is actually an indexing operation with a list passed into it. Um, so I'm saying I want to do a group by year and I want to pull off these columns, the age and the hours worked column, and then take the mean of that. Okay? We have something that looks like that. Um, I'm just going to load in some uh, plotting uh, stuff here. Now, one of the nice things is. Uh, you can plot this relatively easily if you understand how plotting works in pandas. So if you just do a plot, <laughs> excuse me, if you just do a plot in pandas, it is going to plot the index in the x-axis. And then every, every column will be its own line. So he, here we go. The index here is the year, and then age will be its own line, and hours worked will be its own line. Let's do a plot here. There we go, we get something that looks like that. So once you, I, I, I actually think that plotting is easier. I don't know if there's any matplotlib developers here. I think plotting is easier in pandas than it is in matplotlib if you understand what the data needs to look like to get to, get to that point. Okay, um, so, so there we go. By, by adding just that plot on there, we get this plot. Is this the world's greatest plot? No, not necessarily, but it makes it pretty clear that like the age Right, sort of dips around 1985 or so, and then creeps back up. Okay, um, now I, I've been showing what? 
I showed median. I, I think I showed mean up above here. So those are aggregations. You know, of the 400 different things in pandas, uh, a lot of those are aggregations. You can do like mean, median, standard deviation. So here's the maximum uh, age and hours worked for each uh, year. Um, not particularly interesting per se, or not. I mean, you can tell that story without doing that plot. Maybe that plot is interesting. Um, but you can come in here, once you understand this, and you can say, okay, instead of doing mean here, let's do the median, instead of, and let's plot that. Okay, there's the median. Oh no, I meant I want to see the standard deviation. Well, you just plop that out and put standard deviation in there instead. Um, now, this doesn't look particularly great. Um, uh, if, if you look at the index here, it's like, whoa, that's kind of hard to read. And um, that's because I actually, uh, remember I said I wanted by year by sex, I added a group by year and sex here. So what happened in the index is this is now, the index is the thing in bold here. This is what we call a multi-index or a hierarchical index. Um, so, if, so if you're familiar with, um, you know, pivot tables where you can make uh, hierarchies, that's what we're doing here. So we have multiple levels on this. And remember, I said when you tack on a plot here, it's going to take the index and put that in the x-axis. Well, now the index is uh, not just the year, it's both the year and the sex. So you get something that looks like this. It's actually trying to put a tuple in here, which uh, is not uh, particularly appealing to look at, and it's, it's probably wrong as well. So um, watch, watch what I want to do to make this work. Um, this is kind of the trick once you have uh, multiple or hierarchical indexes here. Okay, so here's, here's what I had before. Um, I am going to say unstack. So unstack is one of those things that's a little bit tricky. What it's going to do is by default, it's gonna take the sex index, the inner index, it's going to shift it up into the columns. So we're going to go from hierarchical index to hierarchical columns. Watch this when I run this. Okay, now in the index, I just have the year. However, now I have hierarchical columns. Um, now if I plot this, you can see that the labels have changed. It's like... Um, the, the blue is the age of females, the orange is the age of males, and uh, the green is the, the hours worked of females, and the red is the hours worked of, of males. Right, so, so this is kind of interesting. It tells a different story. Uh, you know, it looks like the females, uh, according to this, are working less, and also they are older than the males. And we can tell that story relatively easy. Um, you know, could we tell that story from looking at the table of data? Yeah, we could have, but I think the visualization would tell this a, a, a lot better. Um, is, is this the world's greatest plot? Well, it does have like this legend here. So, you know, I, I would say like something like this legend uh, B box, I think it's two axis, I think. Two anchor, thank you. Uh, equals uh, zero comma zero, and um, or I'll do one comma one. Stick it on the other side. Okay, so so that's a little bit better. I mean, the, these the hierarchical columns are still kind of a pain, but um, I, I think that's a start on a, a, an okay plot. I mean, and, and this is like five lines of code to do this, right? Um, you know, so so if you want to start looking like like what is going on by uh, sex by year. This is kind of your boilerplate to, to get that working, right? Um, so here, we're, um, here is just age, just looking at age, right? We can just throw an age there. Um, we can stack on a plot. Um, so there, there's the plot of age. Um, we can look at hours worked. Right, um, we can have multiple aggregations as well. Uh, so here, instead of just saying like min or, or mean or, or standard deviation, I can say ag, and then I can pass in a list of aggregations. In this case, I'm passing in uh, the strings for min, max, and mean, but I'm also passing in a function, 
right? And you can, you can make your own function if you want to. All it needs to do is take a group and aggregate it. In this case, this is kind of a silly one. It's just a pedagogical example, but it's just saying, I want the second value. So return the second value for each group using iloc, um, which is an aggregation. And there you go. Um, now we have hierarchical columns here and hierarchical index. Uh, for age, you have the min, max, mean, and the second entry. Uh, for hours worked, you have the min, max, mean, and the second entry as well. So once you understand this basic uh, way of, of grouping and aggregating, you can do some pretty powerful things, especially when you couple that with plotting. Okay, so for our uh, remaining time, um, we'll do some of these aggregations. I'll give you a couple minutes to work on, on some of these aggregations here, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, questions before we do that? Questions? Okay. Yeah, so aggregations, I think, super powerful. Uh, my take on them is you just got to get the syntax right. And once you start understanding the syntax and understanding how unstack works and understanding plotting, uh, it kind of opens uh, the doors and gives you a lot of power. Okay, let's look at some of these. Um, I don't know if we'll go through all of them, so maybe um, I guess I'll start from the top unless people have specific ones just because we are getting short on time here. Um, does anyone have a specific one that they really want me to do? This one, most popular college major for each year? Okay. Um, okay. So first of all, I need to convert this word problem into like code or like think about how I convert it, right? It's like those math problems in junior high or high school where they gave you this sentence and you're like, what do I do with that? Um, we need to do the same thing here. So I, I see um, most popular college major for each year. So uh, that is telling me for each year it says I need to group by year. And then um, I want to get the counts of the college majors for each year. Um, so I, I think I should be able to do this with size. Let's see if I can do this. Um, so here's GSS. And we have major. So I'm going to group by major. Oh, sorry, not group by major. I'm going to group by year. And then, whoops. And then we have uh, major one. Okay, so that this is lazy, it's not doing anything, and I'm gonna ask for the size. Okay, so th this is th um, probably not what I want. Um, let's try the, th this is the number of uh, counts for each year of those. Um, let's do this, let's do value counts. Okay. Um, now, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and look what this gave me. This is kind of weird. Um, it gave me a, is this a series or a data frame? Right, right, right. I hear some mumbling. I hear some series. It is a series. How do I know it's a series? Because it's in monospace font. Okay. And I'm, I'm half joking, but half true. Uh, Panda, or not Jupiter, um, shows series in monospace fonts. When you have a data frame, it shows them as like HTML fancy. Okay, um, so this is a series. Um, let, let's unstack it here because it's got a hierarchical index here. Okay, and... Um, Okay, so how do we get um, the most popular college major for each year? Let's. How did I do this before? Let's see. Um, yeah. Look. I guess, 
Yeah, I guess uh, th this probably. Um, Well, we could group, yeah, we could group by year and college major, but we're probably going to get the same, the same thing if we do that. Um, all right, we can say GSS um, group by year and major one, and then we could do something like this, like size here, right, which is kind of the same thing um so the we could unstack that um then i guess we could do Yeah, I'm. Okay. Um, major them by year. So we're going to swap swatch these and do a max. Or I mean, we can just transpose it like that. Um, Um, yeah, I guess, I guess what I would probably do is, is, is I'd probably do a plot of this. Um, you want an argmax? Yeah, I, th this is a case where I would probably do this, B box to anchor. And um, yeah, we could, or we could write a, yeah, do an arg max or talk to the pandas developers to do that. But this, this, th this is one where like visualizing it makes it pretty easy if you can figure out what, what this one is, um, which is kind of hard because um, um, there's so many colors in there. So um, let, let's do one more, th one more thing if I can fi figure this out. Um, no answer. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that was no answer. Okay. So I was going to figure out no answer, but there it is. So yeah, probably we want to filter out no answer and then redo it and figure out what this one is down here. Um, okay. Sorry if that was kind of a letdown. Um, Sorry, so, uh, IDX Max. IDX Max. Okay, let me let me let me let me get this down here. Sorry. No, you're good. So you want me to do uh, transpose and then IDX Max? Ta-da, okay. Uh, and then we could do like, uh, let's do this. Query um, major one uh, not equal to no answer. Okay, and then business administration. Okay, awesome. Love it when uh, I get help from the audience. Okay, um, yeah. I'll, I can stick around here if people want to um, um, look at these, uh, but we're out of time here, and I think it's lunchtime. So what I want to do before we leave is um, I, I will upload this to GitHub, and I'll, I'll put a gist, and I'll, I'll if you if you want a link to it, you can you can uh, either email me or DM me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, so summary. Uh, 
uh, hopefully you've, you've seen that uh, if you're using the correct types here, um, and, and Pyre is going to help with this, you're going to get uh, a bunch of memory savings. And again, because Pandas, uh, the library wants to run in memory, that can allow you to ac access more data, which can be super useful. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about chaining. Try it out. I think it will make your life easier. Um, application, again, uh, slow for math. Aggregations are powerful. Uh, play around with them. I'm going to do a big book giveaway. I've got um, uh, two books, Effective Pandas and Effective XG Boost. So we'll do that right now. If you want a business card or whatever, you can come up to me afterwards and talk with that, or you can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I also have some more books. I'll do another like book signing later during the conference. I'll put that on Slack and probably on Twitter and LinkedIn. Okay, so um, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to just do it like up by rows and then by chairs. So who's ever in the first row has, has a good chance of winning. Um, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. So we'll, we'll do uh, random, random range um, from one to seven. No one changed to the first row. Wow. Okay. Uh, second row. So I'm counting by ones. I'm a bad Python programmer. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we're going to do one to thirteen because it's the half open interval. And we have three. One, two, three. You can choose a book. And we'll do one more, one more here. So, what do we have? Six rows. Seven. Okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. One. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Have a great conference.